Unknown Empire, the true story of mysterious Ethiopia and the future arc of civilization by Dean W. Arnold, read by the author. Part One, The Barefoot and the Castrated, the arc for Africa's greatest battle with the West. Prologue. I did not want to ask him if the Ark of the Covenant was in Ethiopia. It is a question that is too often asked, and I had already asked the question to a great many people. As I sat down to interview this theological leader of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, I wanted to know the answer to the deeper question. Why? Why, if the Ark really does exist, is it in Ethiopia, of all places? Why didn't God just hide such a relic in a cave somewhere or let it decompose, I asked him. Why in his wisdom do you think God decided that this particular artifact would be so preserved by one particular nation? What is the purpose? What is the reason? He laughed. Then I laughed. His was not a lighthearted chuckle. It was a sentiment of compassion. He was exhibiting what I have found to be part of the Ethiopian character, a gentle and quiet meekness that disguises an almost incomprehensible confidence. He smiled again and spoke with hesitation. The response would be somehow difficult for you to accept or to believe in. I waited. I hadn't traveled to the country three different times to let him off the hook at this critical point. There is a belief or a tradition in Ethiopia, he said, or a consideration, he hesitated again, that Ethiopians are, he was right, it was too much to handle right away. Chapter 1. The runner created a stir at the starting line of the 1960 Olympic marathon in Rome, land of emperors. This thin Ethiopian caught the attention of his Western opponents. Oh, well, that's one we can beat, quipped an Australian runner to his teammates. No black African had ever won a gold medal, not in any sport. Abeba Bakila, 28, had just started training four years before. He had one other glaring handicap as he waited for the starting gun to fire. He was barefoot. Bakila had actually hidden in the tent a few minutes earlier to avoid the snickers from his opponents. He had tried running shoes at various times, but they hadn't felt right. Boys in Ethiopia grow up walking and running several miles a day in search of good grazing for their livestock. They never seemed bothered by the blazing sun that the ancient Greeks assumed must be closest to mankind in this land of burnt faces, as they called it. Aeth to burn plus ops face, aethops. Many people in 1960 also used the Latin Arab term Abyssinia, meaning mixed, which shows up even today in the various shades of color and sharp to round features across the population. However, the people themselves lean toward the earlier term, as Greek writings are filled with fantastic compliments of this ancient race. Homer called them the blameless Ethiopians. As a child, Bakila spent his days like other barefoot children, caring for animals and attending church school. Like today, they lived in straw-roofed mud huts. The largest building in his village was the church an institution that has likely modeled heaven for the earthly tribe for over a thousand years. Ethiopia claims one of the most ancient Christian traditions in the world, beginning with the biblical character they call Bacos, the well-known Ethiopian eunuch of Acts chapter 8 in the New Testament. This secretary of the treasury under Queen Candace was baptized by Philip after asking the apostle questions about the book of Isaiah which Bacos was reading while sitting in his chariot, adding credence to Ethiopia's claim to 1,000 years of Old Testament worship before the time of Christ. For the 26-mile race, 42 kilometers, Bakila wore bright red shorts and a green shirt with the number 11 on it. 
Video of the Olympic coverage provides a lengthy shot of the odds-on favorite Russian runner Sergei Popov looking confident, laughing, and joking with a friend as they wait for the race to begin. For a moment, the camera shows Bakila's face. The commentator asks, and what's this Ethiopian called? The New York Times provides a description of the beginning of the race. It started at Campidoglio Square, designed by Michelangelo, skirted the Circus Maximus and the Baths of Caracalla, and went along the 2,000-year-old Appian Way and ended at the Arch of Constantine. As the lean little Ethiopian approached the brilliantly illuminated arch close by the ruins of the Forum and Colosseum, thousands cheered. The Roman imagery was highly ironic. Bakila was forced to move to another village at the age of three when the Italian military invaded his country to claim their long-desired colony. Ethiopia was the last holdout for an African continent otherwise completely conquered by Europe. A few years earlier, Italian Colonel G.B. Luciano objected when colonization was being questioned. I have no intention of degrading the Abyssinian race, strong, intelligent, and noblest among the indigenous peoples, but I insist that in many respects we are superior to it, especially as to civilization. And we should not renounce the supremacy of the white race over these peoples. He continued his thoughts on interbreeding, which he felt causes the downfall and decay of a superior race. Bakila was never critical of the Italians. He was very polite, very humble, said Ani Nascanen, his Scandinavian trainer. From the bottom of his heart, he was a good man. Niskanen told his family back in Sweden that the Ethiopians were rather quiet but very nice. Nevertheless, the people historically have never taken a liking to invasion. A few decades before Bakila's village was occupied, Emperor Johannes IV gave a clear response to the Italians who first demanded that they hand over their country for colonial purposes. How could I ever agree to sign away the lands? over which my local ancestors governed, said Johannes. Christ gave them to me. Conflicts inevitably ensued. The very nice Ethiopians had a penchant for castrating both their dead trophies and prisoners of war. In one account, it took eight men to hold down one Italian soldier. I still have my hands, he said. When I heal, I want to mow down all the Abyssinians. Ethiopia's reputation existed as far back as 50 BC, when it was described by Diodorus Siculus, one of the most reliable ancient historians. They have never experienced the rule of an invader from abroad, and although many and powerful rulers have made war upon them, not one of these has succeeded in his undertaking. Ethiopia is, quote, the land of God, according to other ancient writers a phrase repeated by a publication approved by the Ethiopian church, which adds, and she will survive until the end of the world. In between fighting colonists in the modern era and defeating invaders in the ancient and classical ages, Ethiopia has spent a millennium fighting Muslims on its borders as a majority Orthodox Christian country. However, within her borders, Ethiopia remains somewhat peaceful today with its 35% Muslim minority. Muhammad allegedly outlawed jihad there when the Christian emperor Arma took in Muslim refugees. However, Islamic countries have relentlessly attempted to encroach on every side of the country, making Ethiopia the island of Christianity in Africa and the source of the medieval Prester John legend of the only non-European Christian nation in a land of mountains far, far away. The TV commentator finally dug up the name of the Ethiopian runner among the 69 contestants. Bakila, the African, hasn't taken part in international competition before, he noted. World Sport Magazine said Ethiopians run past farmers driving teams of oxen, plowing the land in much the same way as their forefathers did in biblical times. This statement was no stereotype. They grow the grain teff and they make the honey wine tedge. We Abyssinians are a poor people with no mechanical support, 
Bikila said in a later interview. So we run everywhere on foot. 40 kilometers are nothing to me. Before the race, one resourceful reporter found a translator and was able to ask a few questions. Why do you run barefoot? Habit. Will you be able to finish the race? If I were not going to finish the race, I would not start it to begin with. Bakila may have been a bit energized by the date, September 10th, a day before the Ethiopian New Year, September 11th, by the calendar. However, liturgically, he was indeed running on the New Year, the eve of which was being celebrated back home. Traditionally, a day begins with prayers in the evening before the celebration of the Eucharist the next morning at the house of worship, and that ritual starts with the priest cutting loaves in a side building they call Bethlehem, house of bread, all corresponding to the pattern in Genesis 1, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Ethiopians also celebrate on this day the return of the Queen of Sheba to Ethiopia after visiting Israel's King Solomon, the two luminaries of ancient Ethiopia. This famous Old Testament story does not include the interesting details in the Ethiopian tradition, which tells us that their visit was so good that they had a son, not beyond the pale for a king with a thousand partners, according to 1 Kings 11. Through this connection, Ethiopia claims to hold the Ark of the Covenant, the golden chest built by Moses, the central object of the Israelite temple, and perhaps the greatest treasure in history. Do they? This book will follow the trail. One by one, the competitors began to fall off the pace like a flock of birds dissolving. Within a few kilometers, two groups of four or five runners each emerged at the front, Bakila was in the second group with the Russian, Sergei Popov, and a New Zealander, Barry McGee. The lead group included a former French soldier, an Englishman, and a Belgian. Belgium was an infamous pioneer of colonialism. While Britain was establishing colonies from the Cape to Cairo, France gobbled up North Africa and Algeria. Belgium targeted the Congo. Sometime after 1876, Belgium's King Leopold II sent Henry Morton Stanley on a deep state secret mission inside the Congo. Of the 16 million people there, only 8 million survived the brutality of Leopold's regime. However, most people only remember the romantic story of Stanley meeting a missing white missionary in the Congo's interior and saying, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Ethiopia's past success against invaders provided inspiration for African countries in the 20th century as they fought to gain back their lands from Western occupation and domination. Many take refuge regarding such harsh views and behaviors by Westerners as being only a thing of the past. But some are still fans of the Belgian emperor. We need a modern King Leopold to assist the noble savage for a better life according to a comment on an article by Doug Casey, an author who a few years ago spent weeks as a number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Africans don't have the Protestant work ethic of Europeans, wrote Casey. The continent has no civilization, no economy, no technology, no military power. Another New York Times bestselling author, a Harvard and Oxford scholar, is also quite willing to defend Western civilization. It's not Eurocentrism, writes Niall Ferguson in Civilization, the West and the Rest. It's a statement of the obvious. A strategic investment advisor, Casey is actually a fan of the continent's future. Africa is going to be the epicenter of what's happening in the world for years to come, he admits, basing his conclusions on birth rates, which are below replacement level in the West. They are strong but declining in Asia. In Africa, they are booming. These mathematical certainties point to a civilizational shift that we may not have seen since the northern European barbarians camped across the Rhine River from Roman territory in the 5th century. When the river froze, they marched across and defeated the Romans and went on to sack the capital of the 1,000-year-old empire. They had no idea their battle would mark the end of an age. 
says Ethiopian scholar Serju Habel Selassie. Ethiopia is regarded by modern Europeans much in the same way as ancient Britain was regarded by the Romans. Another commenter on Casey's article understands what is at stake. If there is not some form of mandatory birth control, we are in real trouble. This might sound like an offhand remark, but the latter part of this book will address in great detail the substance of his comment. As the Arch of Constantine, illumined by the setting sun, faded from the view of the marathon contestants, a shift began to emerge in the leading groups. The shoeless Ethiopian had moved up from the second group of runners. He had now passed the Russian, the favorite at the beginning of the race. By the 15th kilometer, he had reached the back of the leading group, a pack of four that included only those associated with Britain, Belgium, and France. And there's that unknown Ethiopian we saw earlier, announced the commentator. He's called a Bebe Bikila. He's barefoot. Chapter 2 I got in his face and yelled at him. I was upset. My guide, as I toured the holy city of Aksum, had been late several days in a row and I feared my opportunities would soon disappear if we didn't get a move on it. His name is Bazian, named after one of the Magi, the three wise men that visited Jesus and gave gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Ethiopians believe one of the Magi was Ethiopian. Bazian is the nicest guy you'll ever meet, but he did share the cultural quality called momfok by British scholar Richard Pankhurst, a tendency to always be late. But in typical Ethiopian fashion, Bazian did not return my anger. He was apologetic. He was kind. The next day, we found ourselves in a small village in the northern Tigray region, enjoying an hour-too-long coffee session. Goats and a donkey wandered nearby. We sat on stones with a dirt patio. Bazian is in his late 20s, tall, striking, a black African with sharp Arabic features, his colleagues call him the king because of his royal heritage. He was wearing a white prayer robe, typical of ordained deacons of the church. In this setting, he reminded me of a young prophet. Ethiopians come from the tribes of Judah, Levi, and Dan, he told me. Who else was Ethiopian? I asked. Enoch was Ethiopian, he replied. He walked with God. Bazian was alluding to the cryptic character in Genesis 5 who gets one verse of description. Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. Bazian is fluent in both his tribal tongue, Tigrinya, and Amharic, the national language. He also speaks perfect English, and for good reason. He was raised in Toronto. He moved back to his country of birth four years ago to study at the country's keynote Orthodox seminary. He believes, like all Ethiopian Orthodox, that the Sheba Solomon story is true. Ethiopians don't call themselves Jewish, he said, sipping a small porcelain cup of coffee with no handles. They followed Old Testament practices in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek also Ethiopian, according to Bazian, is another strange character in the Bible who only appears one time, acting as a priest to Abraham after the founder of Israel wins a key battle. Melchizedek serves him bread and wine, a foreshadowing of the Eucharist, and, quote, blesses him, Genesis 14, 18, and 19. Abraham responds by treating him as a superior, giving him a tenth of all his possessions, then Melchizedek disappears. The Bible does not provide any hints related to where Melchizedek came from or where he went. Professor Germa Batu, the man I quoted at the beginning of this book, the vice academic dean of Ethiopia's largest seminary, shied away from articulating Ethiopia's significance, but agrees with Bazian's thoughts on Enoch and Melchizedek. It's a position taken by some scholars in the church, Girma told me. 
Enoch and Melchizedek lived an ascetic life. He said that the monasticism of Ethiopia preceded even the time of Christ, something that sounded to me like the school of prophets discussed in the Old Testament. Today, there are as many as a thousand monasteries in Ethiopia. Are there any monasteries today that claim to be part of this tradition of Melchizedek and Enoch? I asked Germa. Each and every monastery, he said. One hundred years before Abiba Bakila's 1960 marathon, England's Queen Victoria sent an envoy to Ethiopia to present the gift of a pistol to the man they called Theodore, also known as the Barefoot Emperor, according to the title of his biography by Philip Marsden. In Ethiopia, his name was Tawodros. Neither Victoria nor Tawodros knew this gift of a pistol would lead to the murder of a monarch. Like most Ethiopians, Tawodros attended a church school to learn the basics in the Bible. He was then sent to a convent at Lake Tana for more training in ancient and modern European history, literature, and even some Shakespeare. Along with the pistol, Victoria sent him a royal letter in 1855 upon his inauguration as Tawodros II, Emperor of Ethiopia. Tawodros's return letter was never answered. British envoy Charles Cameron delivered the initial letter and the pistol. After a full year, Cameron continued to insist that the Queen would respond to the request in the Emperor's return letter for skilled technicians for Ethiopia's advancement. Tawodros was also hopeful for an alliance between two Christian nations against Muslim countries on his every side. Sudan, Egypt, and Somalia. Finally, Cameron returned home to inquire about the emperor's letter. When Tawodros learned that Cameron traveled back through enemy Egyptian and Turkish territories, the emperor's suspicions mounted. Victoria was not simply ignoring him. Christian advancement had to be weighed with the priorities of empire, money, and trade. The Suez Canal had recently opened on the Red Sea at Ethiopia's northeast border, but Egypt had built a port in Ethiopian territory at Masawa. France, Britain's greatest rival, had built a port near Masawa at Djibouti. Britain needed access to those waters without depending on France and could not afford to upset Muslim powers. Tawodros's initial instructions were for Cameron to hand-deliver the letter to Victoria, which he failed to do. Tawodros was impatient. The technical skills he needed were not only for civilizing Ethiopia, he needed weapons. Without advanced cannons and rifles, he could not defeat the Muslims on his borders. When he became emperor, he brought to his court an 11-year-old prince, the son of a king who fell victim to Tawodros's expansion. This boy would one day be featured on the cover of Vanity Fair, the Time magazine of its day, sharing the honor with such notables as British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, Charles Darwin, Napoleon III, and Russia's Tsar Alexander. The boy's father named him Menelik, meaning son of the king. More importantly, it was the name of the son born to Solomon and Sheba, both to Wodros and Menelik, in fact, all Ethiopian emperors claim direct descent from Solomon himself through Menelik I. A 2008 publication of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church says that Solomonian descent provides a divine right for their rule, and their claim was confirmed by the church. 20th century emperor Haile Selassie was officially declared in the Ethiopian constitution to be the 225th descendant of Menelik I, son of Solomon. The emperor and boy developed a Saul and David type relationship. Although he killed my father, said Menelik later, he always loved me as a son. He educated me with the greatest care and almost showed for me greater affection than for his own son. Like Saul confessed to David, Tuodros told Menelik more than once that he would follow him as emperor. 
but the young Menelik's destiny would lie in wait until the fate of Tuodros and Victoria unfolded. Tuodros impressed Britain early on as a progressive king who announced the end of castration as a military practice, but he grew irritated with European missionaries, their work seeming redundant in an historic Christian nation, a majority of which attended the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. He allowed missionaries to only proselytize the minority Muslims, pagans, and Jews. After more delay from Victoria, he rounded up several missionaries and demanded they make weapons for him, but they failed to deliver as they were teachers, not technicians. Further delay from Cameron led to Wodros to arrest a British missionary to Ethiopian Jews, Henry Stern who had written a pamphlet calling the emperor barbaric, cruel, and unstable. The king held him at gunpoint, but instead of killing him, he had Stern chained and severely treated, and his assistants flogged with bamboo rods. Cameron finally returned, without the long-awaited letter from Queen Victoria, but begged for more time, offering his own head if the letter did not arrive in two months. Instead, the emperor locked him up in prison. Finally, a letter from Victoria arrived. She instructed Cameron to leave for Mosawa, the Egyptian port on the Red Sea. Tawodros was not mentioned. Enraged, the emperor imprisoned a dozen more British subjects. Cameron sent a curt message to the queen. No release until civil answer to King's letter arrives. Three years after Tawodros's initial letter, Victoria sent a message simply demanding the release of all her British subjects. This time, it was Tawodros who refused to answer. The Ethiopian emperor picked a tough opponent. Britain boasted the largest empire in history, a record that still stands. It needed the Ottoman Empire, today's Turkey, to serve as a buffer with Russia and couldn't risk that strategic peace to help Ethiopia. In addition, cotton was extremely difficult to obtain after the Confederate defeat in the American Civil War. The Red Sea Lanes provided Egyptian Sudanese cotton. Instead of help, Victoria sent to Ethiopia one of the larger European armies to ever touch African soil, 20,000 strong which began unloading their weapons just below Djibouti, France's Red Sea port, one mountain range to the east of Tuodros's palace. Commanding General Robert Napier navigated Ethiopia's historic wall of defensive mountains by using 45 Indian elephants with Armstrong field guns strapped to their backs and sides. Earlier, Tuodros had beaten to death two of Stern's missionary assistants. His erratic behavior, like King Saul's Jekyll and Hyde behavior toward David in the Bible, forced Prince Menelik three years before Napier's expedition at the age of 20 to escape his mentor's clutches. He reclaimed Shewa, the throne of his father in the province to the south, the region of the future Addis Ababa. A Muslim aristocrat, angry with Tuodros for imprisoning her son, helped Menelik get away by providing a river crossing in her territory. For helping Menelik, her imprisoned son and his companions were seized in the presence of the king and his nobles and hacked and chopped to pieces, not unlike Saul's murder of the priests who helped David in 1 Samuel 22. Tawodros killed 29 more Muslim dignitaries, as well as 12 Christian aristocrats. His power was waning throughout the empire. Menelik, once a prince but now a king, discerned the shift in power and sent a letter to Queen Victoria in 1867 asking for Britain's friendship with Shewa. He referred to himself as King of Kings, an early bit of evidence for his larger ambitions. No Ethiopian force could match the British army approaching Tuodros' stronghold. Would this be the final conquering that the nation had avoided for millennia? Or would Protestant England respect Abyssinia's Orthodox Christian heritage? For now, 
Ethiopia was being ignored in favor of Muslim merchants. And the fact that a Prester John legend even existed proved how unaware Europeans could be of other Christian people. According to the first English voyage to the, quote, Dark Continent in 1554, all of the people of Africa engaged in beastly living without a god, laws, religion, or commonwealth, and so scorched and vexed with the heat of the sun, they curse it when it rises. Without a god is not accurate for the Ethiopian part of Africa. Most people would be surprised to learn that Africa, in fact, boasts the first Christian empire. Ethiopia became the second nation after Israel to believe in Christ, stated the Ethiopian patriarch Paulus I to a synod of bishops at the Vatican in 2009. Ethiopian leaders also say that the archangel Michael himself instructed the party escorting Sheba's son back to Ethiopia to steal the Ark of the Covenant from the temple. On their return voyage, they and the Ark flew a cubit above the Red Sea. Maybe so, but where is the proof? We don't need proof because it's a fact, a monk at the Tana Kirkos Monastery told a Smithsonian Magazine reporter. The monks here have passed this down for centuries. Indeed, the ancient roots of the Ethiopian church have been faithfully passed down by oral tradition since the days of the Ethiopian eunuch. Skeptics abound. Only European man is rational, according to followers of the legendary Western thinker Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud's disciple and chosen torchbearer. In Jung's view, Africans have not yet reached an evolutionary stage of consciousness that involves creative, critical thinking. The scoffers of Ethiopia's oral tradition regarding their early Christian empire ate some humble pie in 1969 when a Greek inscription was uncovered with a proclamation from Ethiopian Emperor Izena, dated to A.D. 330. I, Izena, king of Ethiopia, have been given great victory by the power of Christ God in whom I have believed. This reference is one of nearly ten references to Christ and the Trinity in the inscription. At first, Izena minted his coins, one of only four nations minting coins at the time, with the pagan symbols of the crescent moon and disc. But starting in approximately A.D. 330, the coins included crosses, the first time this Christian symbol occurred on any coin anywhere. When they did appear on Roman coins, the crosses were much smaller than the prominent symbols encompassing the entire backside of Ethiopian currency. One coin even bears the phrase, In this cross you will conquer, undoubtedly related to Roman Emperor Constantine's famous words from the battle at Milvian Bridge in A.D. 312 upon seeing an apparition of the sun with a cross above it and the Greek words, In this sign conquer. Ancient documents also provide no doubt that the Ethiopian Christian Empire was dominant by the year A.D. 356. In that year, Roman Emperor Constantius II wrote a passionate letter to Ethiopia's Archbishop Frumentius, begging the Trinitarian Empire to back his embattled non-Trinitarian kingdom, at that time controlled by the Arian heresy, which taught that Christ was created, not God himself. Frumentius refused. But can such a great Christian empire to which the Roman emperor was writing, appear overnight? In fact, estimates of an A.D. 330 conversion for Ethiopia may be quite conservative. Izena and his country may have converted years before the first Christian coin was minted. What about Rome as the first Christian empire? Emperor Constantine declared Christianity legal for Rome along with other religions in A.D. 315, but it was not made the official religion of the empire until A.D. 380 under Emperor Theodosius. Izena's 330 date wins the day. Ethiopia was the first Christian empire. What Patriarch Paulus proclaimed at the Vatican in 2009 
was correct. All this to say, those early English explorers in Africa were quite mistaken when lumping in Ethiopia as godless. Ethiopian Emperor Izena built the Church of St. Mary of Zion in the city of Aksum in A.D. 340. Oral tradition says the Ark of the Covenant was transferred there from a synagogue in Ethiopia and has remained in the country ever since. Might the invading British General Robert Napier want the Ark? The British have always been legendary treasure hunters, and what could possibly be better for the British Museum than the world's most coveted artifact? British explorer James Bruce toured Ethiopia in the 1700s. This giant swashbuckling adventurer was the first of his kind to provide European exposure to Abyssinia, and certainly the most prolific, as he wrote five volumes on the subject. He also happened to acquire a great many ancient manuscripts for himself and the museums back home. Among his prized collection was the Book of Enoch, a mystical Jewish book quoted or alluded to several times in the New Testament. Jude 1.14 cites Enoch directly, and considered historically reliable by other Orthodox groups. While not part of the West's scriptures, it's in the Ethiopian Bible. Until this time, Europe only had fragments of the Book of Enoch and believed that the full scroll had passed out of existence. In the ancient book, Enoch talks with angels. We are given names for the nine archangels, including Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, and Uriel. We also learn that evil angels decided to mate with human women who gave birth to giants. And we learn from Enoch that the leading evil angel, a Miserach, taught humans how to cast and resist spells. Kokopiel taught fortune-telling, and Tamiel taught astrology. While much of the strange content in Enoch corresponds with a passage in Genesis 6 that has often been interpreted as describing angels mating with women and producing giants, most Western rationalists, their rank-and-file busy building the British Empire, consider it laughable. But not necessarily their elite. Ironically, the term British Empire was coined by a key founder of science and mathematics, John Dee, who, like Enoch, spent many years talking with angels. A key advisor and top spy to Queen Elizabeth I, John Dee, spent his final 20 years focused almost exclusively on contacting angels, or as one of his manuscripts is entitled, a true and faithful revelation of what passed for many years between Dr. John D. and some spirits. A spiritual entity he called Uriel gave him prophecies. Other spirits provided hidden insights for science, technology, and astrology. For those wondering if he was dealing with good or bad spirits, a decent clue given is that all of these angelic discussions led to D. engaging in wife-swapping with his colleague, while all four sought esoteric wisdom in the act. D. signed his secret correspondence to Elizabeth as 007, giving the occultist a Hollywood legacy as well. As recently as 1967, the United States' key intelligence service, the National Security Agency, referred to, quote, Our Man D in its NSA technical journal. He is described as a principal advisor to most of the Tudor monarchs of England and to certain European rulers as well. He excelled in mathematics, cryptography, natural science, navigation, library science, and above all, in the really rewarding sciences of those days, astrology, alchemy, and psychic phenomenon. Dee's work today is known as Enochian magic. These contradictions in Western society between rationalism and supernaturalism will be explored in later chapters. But for our purposes at this moment, we can see why the British elite held so much interest in certain Ethiopian artifacts. The Ark would be no exception. British General Robert Napier made no mention of the Ark 
at the onset of his expedition into Ethiopia. While driving his elephants toward Emperor Tawodros's small army, the British commander decided to include the classic operation of divide and conquer in his strategy and contacted the two kings who were Tawodros's greatest rivals. Ethiopia is home to a number of quote-unquote kings, many descended from Solomon. The succeeding emperor is not always the previous emperor's relative. One king was Ras Kasa Marcha of Tigray, the most ancient Ethiopian territory, which included the northern city of Aksum, known as the Ethiopian Jerusalem, and where the ark-holding church of St. Mary of Zion resided. Ras Kasa enthusiastically accepted Napier's deal to help him defeat the emperor in exchange for weapons. Menelik, who was mentored by Tawodros, now ruled as the other most powerful king in the country and headed north to meet Napier in the Muslim-held Wolo area, but he returned home under the auspices of celebrating Easter in Christian territory. Tawodros was left with little help from the remaining Ethiopian leaders and was limited to a small force. The British methodically marched toward his mountain stronghold. Cornered, Tawodros offered to free the British prisoners and make a treaty. Napier refused. When they broke into Tawodros' headquarters, the emperor of Ethiopia placed a gun to his mouth and shot himself dead. He used the pistol he received from Victoria. Chapter 3 No Women Allowed was hand-painted on a small wooden sign as I approached the monastery in Aksum just a few yards from the building that contains the Ark of the Covenant. A diminutive monk, looking old but spry, helped me in the front door. The building was centuries old, rather stark and plain. It resembled an old medieval fort. In fact, the Ark was said to have resided in this structure for centuries before being moved to today's smaller chapel nearby. I removed my shoes before entering. Shoes are always removed. No Orthodox service exists any place where someone with shoes is allowed to enter the building. Ethiopian Orthodox Christians worship God with bare feet or stockinged feet, but always without shoes. These monasteries are old-school institutions, and some issues are non-negotiable. Birth control is one such issue. It is never allowed. The broader church is less vocal, even though it holds the same position. However, the old school types and monasteries have never wavered. God's first command was to be fruitful and multiply, and that has never changed. In fact, it is this issue that brought me to Ethiopia in the first place. For decades, I watched global birth rates with alarm. The West is doomed to decline over the next century. A woman in the West averages 1.5 children, way below the replacement rate of 2.1 children. I looked for Christians outside the West, South Korea, a booming Protestant country with a rate of 6.0 in 1960, has dropped to an alarming 0.96 rate. Historically, Orthodox Russia, now at a still scary level of 1.75, is struggling with all her might to recover from its 1.16 rate of three decades ago. No country in history has ever recovered from a rate of 1.3 children per woman. Ethiopia averages around five children per woman, as does the rest of Africa, making it the continent of the future. Only Ethiopia has a Christian tradition in sub-Saharan Africa longer than 200 years, or a written language and script that precedes colonization. Therefore, it serves as the spiritual and cultural leader of this ascendant continent. Fittingly, the African Union, Africa's United Nations, is permanently seated in Ethiopia. Ethiopia may become the future of Christendom. 
At current rates, there will be more Ethiopians than Russians in 50 years. But maybe not. My professor friend, Girma Batu, says the numbers are a bit deceiving. The high rate in population size is mostly Muslim, he told me, expressing concern that the 45% Orthodox Christian to 35% Muslim ratio could flip in current conditions. There are sponsors that want to multiply the number of Muslims. They want to make Ethiopia an Islamic country, a Muslim-dominated country. It is an unfair fight. Muslims are allowed to take several wives. Ethiopian Orthodox are allowed only one. In addition, Americans and the West are working furiously to bring down the birth rate by advancing contraception across Ethiopia. However, as Muslims refuse to use the contraceptives, Bill Gates and company focus their efforts on the traditional Christians. Of the four ethnic groups with the highest birth rates, only one, the fourth highest and smallest of the four, is Christian. They are contributing contraceptive methods and even abortion sometimes, said Girma, regarding the population control advocates. At least one, maximum two children, that's enough, they say. Those who want to be moderns, they are exactly copying the West, said Bill Gates. The biggest things are the modern tools of contraception. This said regarding the targeting of Africa by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I learned an interesting tidbit about the small hotel where I was staying in Aksum before I hitched a ride that day to visit the monastery next to the Ark. A few months before... Melinda Gates had been a guest at the same hotel. As their Saul-like emperor had clearly gone mad over the years, most of Ethiopia rejoiced upon the news of Tawodros' death, but not King Menelik, his former protege. Nonetheless, he proclaimed a public holiday to officially celebrate the historic event. He confessed that he did this only to satisfy the passions of the people. As for me, I should have gone into the forest to weep, he said, in a twist reminiscent of David's musical lament over Saul's death by suicide as the Philistines approached to kill Saul. I have now lost the one who educated me and toward whom I have always cherished filial and sincere affection, said Menelik. He could not betray Tawodros, and this decision cost him a great bounty of weapons that went to King Ross Kassa instead. Ross is a term for nobility. If I had fallen in with the British Army, not only would I have been presented with the rifles and cannon, but I probably would have been elected and proclaimed emperor, Menelik said. Now all is lost, and perhaps another will sit on the throne, which belongs to me by right. However, ambitions for emperor were irrelevant if Britain seized the opportunity to add Ethiopia to its long list of colonial conquests. True to form, a bevy of ancient treasures was seized, including Tuodros's two crowns, his cap and seal, dozens of ancient manuscripts, and an icon of Christ wearing the crown of thorns. These items made their way to the Royal Castle, Oxford Library, and a number of English museums. At the beginning of the expedition, Napier promised, We do not come to conquer Ethiopia, nor to submit her to our rule, but solely to free our brothers, unjustly held prisoner by Theodore. The British general was still over 200 miles from Aksum, the Ethiopian Jerusalem, and no attempt had been made so far to find the Ark of the Covenant. As Menelik feared, Roskasa had the weaponry and power needed to seize the throne. He was soon crowned Emperor Johannes IV in the holy city of Aksum. His path to greatness looked to be sealed when Napier promptly packed up his army and left Ethiopia keeping his promise. Fifteen elephants and two hundred mules were required to carry back the Ethiopic treasures he seized. The British were not comfortable with a black African nation in charge of the Ethiopian coastal city of Masawa, the Red Sea's most strategic port, and they certainly couldn't let their top rival make it a French port. 
as the Italians also had high ambitions for the area, Britain utilized Italy as a compromise solution, keeping the strategic area in rational European hands. A bit of treachery, said reporter Augustus Wilde. Throughout Ethiopia's long saga with Italy, Britain always lurked as the hand behind the curtain. Italy soon followed England's lead and adopted the strategy Napier used to march right into Ethiopia by finding a rival chief. Italy decided to empower this rival with weapons and then divide and conquer. Menelik now played the spoiler role that Johannes had played against Tawodros. The Italians had already met with Menelik years before, and a visitor described him as muscular, most intelligent. With head and feet naked, he was friendly and a fanatic for weapons. Menelik had been championed for years by Italian envoys as a fellow Christian leader defeating Muslims. The cross has defeated the crescent, they wrote. With the new developments, secret negotiations commenced for Menelik to get the mass supply of weapons he had so long desired. Johannes had his own plans for securing his country, wrote author Makila Rong, steeped in legends of the vast Aksumite kingdom, which had stretched in ancient times from modern-day East Sudan to western Somaliland. He dreamt of rebuilding a great trading nation which would roll down from the highlands and spill into the sea, a Christian empire in a region of Islam. His primary weapon to control his rival Menelik was a woman. He successfully arranged a marriage between Menelik and a princess of Johannes' own Tigray region. Tetu Batul did not agree with her new husband's flirtations with the Italians. It was said she could not tolerate the odor of Europeans. She was known to be more of an idealist for Ethiopia than the shrewd Menelik, and a devoutly Orthodox Christian who, according to the court historians, was slender and as beautiful as an angel like St. Mary. For Menelik's part, Britain's Lord Gletchen reported that he rises every morning at 3 a.m., goes to early morning chapel, and at 6 or sooner receives reports. Not all of the accounts were so glowing. An Italian envoy called Menelik, one of the ugliest men I have ever seen, but with a very sweet smile. The Italian may have noticed the scars. His skin was deeply pitted, wrote a biographer the traces of a bout with smallpox. It was a useful mask, a hardened look that belied the subtle, sensitive spirit within. Menelik was not a handsome man, but those who met him remarked on the warmth, kindness, and quiet power in his face. That same writer mentioned Menelik's beautiful, intelligent, and kind eyes, and Tetu's rare, quick wit. He also suggested that Menelik was unfaithful and Tetu may have poisoned one of those lovers. He concluded, It was said that while the gentle Menelik was loved, Tetu was feared. Nevertheless, she was his sounding board, and they worked well together, wrote another biographer. Although Menelik's ambitions for the throne tempted him to challenge the new emperor, Tetu, a Tigrayan like Emperor Johannes, opposed the idea. One area in which the two kings agreed was conversion of the Muslims, but Menelik used a more moderate approach. When Johannes converted the Muslim governor of Wolo with his military, the province over time turned back to Islam. Conversely, Menelik marched to Wolo and threw a giant party. Johannes beat Wolo's king with cannon. I have fought him with honey wine, and I am certain to defeat him. Although effective, Menelik's eating and drinking with Muslims was a scandal to some. It should be noted that Menelik was not opposed to forcing his will if necessary. When he later occupied the strategic city of Harar, a Muslim-dominated coffee trading post connecting Shiwa to Djibouti's Red Sea port, he had the main mosque torn down and replaced with an Orthodox church. This is not a Muslim country, as everyone knows, he said. Eventually, Johannes demanded a visible demonstration of Menelik's loyalty. According to Ethiopian tradition, he was to approach the emperor naked to the waist 
with a stone on his bare back, asking forgiveness and pledging his faithfulness. Menelik balked. Besides the humility involved, Menelik also opposed the tribute of cash and 50,000 cattle that was required. Johannes approached Shewa with a superior army, but to avoid war asked church officials to mediate. This group was headed by his confessor, Abba Girma Salasi. An agreement was reached, and Menelik came out to meet the emperor. He came in the prescribed traditional manner, rock on bare back, and sad and pensive, according to biographer Harold Marcus. The moment he set foot on the rugs in the imperial tent, Johannes' cannons thundered twelve times, announcing the downfall of Shewan independence. Johannes considered Ethiopia united, unaware of Menelik's secret dealings with the Italians. Johannes signed a formal treaty with Italy, under Britain's watchful eye, where the new Europeans in Ethiopia promised not to move beyond the coast. Johannes promised to leave alone the Italian-occupied Masawa port. I wish only to defend my country, he said. Italy championed a course of bringing a civilizing mission to Ethiopia. Lip service was paid early on to focus on the port of Masawa and the coast, not inland, as anti-colonial sentiment was growing back in Rome. The pro-colonizers tried to emphasize the wildlife in Ethiopia, home of the world's largest lions, tallest giraffes, unique baboons, and other exotic creatures. This inventory of the animals was all part of the civilizing mission, as the 19th century was bubbling with scientific curiosity. Africa draws us invincibly towards it, said a member of the Italian Geographical Society. It lies just under our noses, yet up until now we remain exiled from it. Ferdinando Martini, president of the Italian Geographic Society, was a critic of Italy's ambitions for Ethiopia and its northern Red Sea port of Massawa and surroundings, which the Italians renamed Eritrea. Erythros in Greek means red. A prolific writer and member of parliament, Martini came from aristocratic stock and wrote plays like his father. He boasted that his iconoclastic views made enemies for him of every political party. We are liars, he wrote bluntly. We say we want to spread civilization in Abyssinia, but it is not true. Far from being barbaric and idolatrous, these people have been Christians for centuries. But voices like Martini's could not stop the movement of settlers beyond the coast and into the heartland. According to Makila Rong, the Italians knew the boundaries of their fledgling colony would have to be extended into the cool, mosquito-free highlands if it was ever to amount to anything. However, a much larger force was driving the encroachment, population growth. Difficult to envision today, during this period, Italy was booming with Italians. It had one of the highest birth rates in Europe. In a four-year period around that time, 717,000 Italians left for opportunities in America and Australia, where land was already being gobbled up. The number of immigrating Italians soon tripled. Italy, a growing number of politicians came to believe, needed a foreign colony to soak up its land hungry. And why send them to another country if they could relocate to Italian-owned land? Each family received 50 acres in perpetuity if they worked the land for five years. Startup costs and travel were paid for with a 3% loan from the government. Italy loudly proclaimed its declaration of Eritrea as a new colony in 1891. In 1893, the first nine Italian families immigrated into the highlands of Eritrea, moving beyond the mosquito-infested coast. Johannes promised he would grant nothing entailing the cession of an inch of land. A war was brewing. Its first skirmishes began with the successful defeat of 540 Italian soldiers at the town of Dogali. They found themselves surrounded by 5,000 of Johannes' men under one of Ethiopia's greatest generals, Ras Alula. Only 80 Italians survived what became the Dogali Massacre. The rout ignited horror and patriotism in Rome. 
where a train station still today is named Cinquecento, meaning the 500. General Alula's fame in Europe led to reporters saying that he was not so black after all, but more like a brown Englishman, very good looking. Ethiopians across the nation rejoiced over the news of Alula's victory. Everyone except Menelik. He knew what it meant. The enthusiasm of the Abyssinians approached delirium, according to one report. Menelik alone understood the gravity of the situation. For Italian generals in Eritrea, it was only a bump in the road. Their long-term plan was to bring tens of thousands of soldiers to Eritrea, along with the best weapons of Europe. Degali was no reflection of the future. Johannes would not get an opportunity to test the confidence of the Italians to the north. He was forced to look south, where Muslims from neighboring Egypt and Sudan had crossed the border and sacked the second holiest city in Ethiopia, Gondar, the historic home of centuries of emperors. Most of the churches were burned, and thousands of Christians were taken prisoner. Johannes immediately made an about-face with his army to address the crisis. He would, as one ancient Ethiopian manuscript worded it, be baptizing with blood those who had never been baptized with water. Meanwhile, in the south, Menelik was courting Italian officials by providing assistance on scientific adventures in exchange for high-tech weaponry. Menelik was a fanatic for weapons and showed great intelligence and great mechanical ability, his Italian supplier said. He perfectly understood their use and importance and could distinguish the various European makes. In exchange for a few thousand rifles and cannons, Menelik supplied money, servants, mounts, and escorts for the expeditions. He also provided the village of Let Marafia to the Geographic Society as a permanent base of operations. There was a reason he knew all the European makes. The king of Shewa refused to depend on one source for weapons. He was also dealing with the French in secret. His new territory, Harar, known primarily as a haven for coffee merchants, had begun dealing in weaponry, thanks to being on the direct route from Shewa to the French port of Djibouti. Even Taitu was warming up to her husband's secret deals for weapons. She in fact hoped that Johannes, her fellow Tigrayan, would stay occupied fighting others so as to keep his attention away from Italian and French intrigues in southern Shewa. What looked like a possible brewing of hostilities between the emperor and Menelik never developed. Instead, Johannes met his death, fighting the Egyptians and Sudanese on his southwestern border. The emperor was shot first in the right hand, and then as he again advanced by a bullet which passed through his left hand and lodged in his chest. His head was placed on a pike back in Sudan's capital of Khartoum. The Ethiopian army tried to keep his death a secret. They laid his decapitated corpse in a way that suggested that he was wounding and recovering. Unfortunately, the heat of the day speeded decomposition. By nightfall, the stench was unbearable and the truth known. Menelik received this news on March 25th, a few days before the Italians got word. Preparations were made for Menelik's coronation in the capital city of his Shewa region, Addis Ababa, and for a peace treaty with Italy. The great crowning took place in Addis Ababa at the Church of St. Mary on Mount Toto. Archbishop Matiwos, the officiant, commanded the people to be faithful to the new emperor on pains of excommunication. A large feast was held. The emperor wrote to his Italian peer, King Umberto, By the will of God, through the love of the people, the celebration of my coronation was accomplished. Emperor Menelik also wrote Queen Victoria regarding relations between Ethiopia and all of Europe. Once again, no answer was forthcoming. More encroachments from the Italians inland from the coast were followed by rationalizations. They only needed a site with cool climate for the soldiers at Masawa, a refuge in the hot months, and nothing else. Menelik decided to sign a treaty with Italy against Tetu's wishes that would provide the Italian soldiers with the cool air that they allegedly needed. A line was drawn at Asmara, a city in Eritrea just 50 miles south of the coast and 225 miles north of Aksum. However, problems emerged with the interpretation of the treaty, 
and other European royalty were failing to respond to Menelik's communications. Meanwhile, the scandalous treatment of the native people in Eritrea created political problems back in Rome. Officers resorted to enthusiastic use of a whip made of hippopotamus hide that flayed backs raw. Rich Eritreans and esteemed holy men were disappearing at night. One journalist said that their fate was well known. They are being shot, clubbed, and stoned to death, and immediately buried in shallow graves on the outskirts of town. Torture and seizure of all assets were also involved, not for security, but because corrupt Italian officials were greedily intent on confiscating their assets. At least 800 Eritreans were killed this way, according to reports, merely for the offense of wanting to keep their own lands. One account talked of officers drawing lots for the widow of a man to be executed. Another of a cleric begging not to be shot while a soldier fired into the man, cackling like a maniac, the police chief smoking calmly as the pit was filled. The Italian public had lazily taken it for granted that Italy was doing good in Africa its enlightened administration lifting a heathen people out of the primeval slime. The Masawa scandal exposed colonialism at its most bestial. Newspapers demanded an investigation, and Rome announced the establishment of a royal inquiry. To help lead the commission, officials appointed the free-thinking, outspoken playwright Ferdinando Martini, who had been championing the Ethiopian's cause as a writer and a member of parliament. The public was elated to have such an advocate on the commission, and the protesters calmed down for a time. To negotiate Ethiopia and Italy's Treaty of Wikala, named after a town in Ethiopia, Menelik sent to Rome his most trusted nobleman, Ross Maconan Woldy Mikhail of Harar, a Christian governor and scholar, who built the first church in that Muslim city under Menelik's orders. Maconan's many accomplishments would be overshadowed in history by his fathering the future emperor Haile Selassie, whose given name was Tafari Maconan. Fluent in several languages, Maconan was sent by Menelik to become the toast of Rome. By all appearances, an African and a European country were signing a treaty as peers, something unique to history at this point. After Maconan returned, a letter from Queen Victoria arrived. She said that she could not answer Menelik's original letter because the Treaty of Wakala required all communications to go through Italy. This requirement also applied to all other powers and governments. Italy had, for all practical purposes, declared Ethiopia an Italian protectorate, a colony. Most historians concluded this clause of the treaty was the victim of mistranslation. The Amharic language version said it is possible for Ethiopia to involve Italy in its communications with all other nations. The Italian version said Ethiopia consents to do so. Accounts say Menelik and his court were furious, certain the mistranslation was purposeful. However, the Italian army, thousand strong, made further discussion, negotiation, and official protesting irrelevant. They simply invaded the interior of Ethiopia in early 1895, disregarding the treaty line at Asmara, 50 miles from the port city. The encroachment was halfway into Ethiopia from the coast, 225 miles past Asmara, and included the holy city of Aksum the Ethiopian Jerusalem, and home to the Ark of the Covenant. Chapter 4 The Ark of the Covenant is the central object in the Ethiopian church's worship of Jesus Christ. Every one of the tens of thousands of churches in the country use a replica of the Ark in its inner sanctum, serving as the table for the mystical body and blood of Christ. You cannot conduct services without an Ark. Once Italy had occupied Aksum, 
the city containing the ark itself. No self-respecting ruler of Ethiopia could let such an affront stand, wrote Professor Raymond Jonas in his book on Menelik's military campaign, The Battle of Adwa, Harvard University Press, 2011. But Menelik did nothing. He waited. This and other past actions had popularized the phrase, Menelik is a myth. Others fought the Italians. For example, Ross Hagos Tafari, an Eritrean leader who years before agreed to help the Italians, flipped sides to lead a rebellion. One recovers from the bite of a black snake, but never from the bite of a white snake, he said. He was crushed in three days. He had announced that he was fighting for Ross Mangasha, the king of Tigray, son of Johannes, named successor by the dying emperor. Mangasha was never able to mount a successful effort for the throne, despite having under him the nation's best general, Ras Alula, leader of the Degali massacre. The patient Menelik, looking past Mangasha's competing claim to the throne, sent him reinforcements to help in his conflicts with the Italians in the north, but was sorely disappointed when he learned Mangasha simply withdrew, ceding Aksum to his opponent. For the Italians' part, their intelligence ensured them that the leadership in Ethiopia was fragmented, always on the verge of a civil war, and that a reprisal for their invasion was unlikely. More reports assured them that Menelik could not muster up a large army and would only be able to amass 20 or 30,000 men, similar to the Italian numbers, but without their technology, weaponry, or training. Menelik wanted more weapons. He worked with Makonan in Harar to acquire from the French in Djibouti more cannons, guns, and ammunition. More war materiel addressed to Makonan was shipped from Germany and Austria, but the British intercepted those efforts. All this waiting strengthened the Menelik is a myth reputation. He had wined and dined his Muslim opponents in Wolo rather than fighting them like Johannes. He was patient with Mangasha rather than crushing a challenger. He allowed Italy to move 50 miles inward from the coast to Asmara when he signed the Treaty of Wakala. This last action even set off Empress Tetu against her husband. According to Italian agent Augusto Salambini, she said to the emperor, Johannes never wanted to cede an inch of territory. He fought the Italians and he fought the Egyptians. He died for this and you, after such an example, want to sell your country? Menelik's reportedly low number of soldiers emptied the threat made by his ambassador in Europe, who said that the emperor was employing the traditional Ethiopian tactic to entice the enemy into the country and then envelop him with superior numbers. Regarding Tetu's charge of selling off the country, biographer Jonas says, The key question is not whether Menelik could be paid, but whether he could be bought. It was a distinction the Italians were about to learn. The Italian invasion now encompassed over 40,000 square miles, a chunk the size of Ohio. Ethiopia is twice the size of Texas. Italy wanted a swath of land across Africa, just like the other powers. Wrote Makila, France had Algeria. Britain had Kenya. It was only fair that Italy should have her place in the sun. Besides simply wanting to keep up with the empiring Joneses, the Italians were motivated to find some decent land. North Africa and Eritrea were standing on hot, barren rocks. J.A. Rogers paints the picture. The Roman wolf now cast greedy eyes upwards to where his rich, fertile neighbor Ethiopia lay in the cool, well-watered mountains. Europe had grabbed all of Africa save this prize. He licked his chops greedily. He would finish the job. Like other colonizing nations, Italy couched its plan for domination in terms of, quote, civilizing the Ethiopians. The phrase colonial tutelage was a signature of the doctrine, writes J.M. Blout in his book on Eurocentrism. And this conception is found in most history and geography textbooks of the time. Quote, unquote, savages were mental children without qualification. Problematic peoples like the Indians, Ottomans, and Chinese were thought to be childlike in some respects and not in others, Blout writes. 
colonial revolts were obviously irrational, were outbursts of childlike emotion. The Atlanta Constitution, watching from across the ocean, gave its assessment of the situation with an obvious allusion to America's manifest destiny. Africa is already carved up and possessed by the three different governments of Europe, it wrote. The Negro must go, as did the Indian in America. Anti-colonial activists in the West, along with all of Ethiopia, hoped that the official commission inquiring into Eritrean scandals might reverse the invasion and perhaps even declare an end to the colony. Ferdinando Martini, the liberal commission member on whom the activists had put their hopes, shared in a later journal his own experience of the horrors. Martini described an infamous field outside Masawa called the Field of Hunger, where helpless natives were sent to die. Corpses lay here and there with insects which snaked their way through limbs twisted and melted by the rays of the sun. The dead were waiting for the hyenas. The living were waiting for death. Historian Makila describes how Martini takes to his heels after glimpsing a group of young Eritrean girls sifting through mounds of camel dung in search of undigested grain, fighting for mouthfuls from a horse's rotting corpse. Said Martini, I fled, horrified, stupefied, mortified by my own impotence, hiding my watch chain, ashamed of the breakfast I had just eaten and the lunch that awaited me. But when the final report was released months after this horror, Martini made a complete reversal. Makila calls it a counterintuitive conclusion that demonstrated the aristocrat's ability to be both painfully sensitive and chillingly mechanistic. He also had in his sights an appointment to the governorship. The report conceded only a dozen executions, but allowed the overseeing general, Antonio Baldessera, to explain. It was necessary to strike terror into those barbarians to make them submit. The report concluded that not an inch of acquired territory should be surrendered from this fertile and virgin land stretching out its arms to Italian farmers. Martini gives detailed explanations for his reversal in his lengthy memoir, a bestseller in Italy that stayed in print for 40 years. I would have preferred us to never have gone to Africa. I did what little I could when there was still time to get us to return home, but now that time has passed. We have started the job. Succeeding generations will continue to depopulate Africa of its ancient inhabitants down to the last one. One race must replace another. It's that or nothing. We will have to hunt him down and encourage him to disappear, just as has been done elsewhere with the Redskins, using all the methods of civilization, which the native instinctively hates. Injustice and violence will be necessary sooner or later, and the greater our success, the more vital it will be not to allow trivial details or human rights to hold us up. Makila provides the underlying notions for the shocking stance of Martini, who did indeed go on later to become governor of Eritrea. The views he expressed were the notions of his day, an era in which Darwin's theories of natural selection and survival of the fittest were used to justify the slaughter of Congo's tribes, by Belgian King Leopold's mercenaries and other colonial conquests, the intellectually and technologically superior white race would push aboriginal tribes into extinction. Surely Menelik realized that the Italians and Europeans were never going to back down. He had waited, and he continued to wait. Why? Menelik possessed, quote, acute strategic imagination according to biographer Raymond Jonas. Sometimes being a leader means knowing what not to do. More weapons were needed. More importantly, Ethiopia was divided, but not as badly as Italy believed. The reports they received were primarily sent by Menelik himself through double agents. As he had hoped, the leaders of Ethiopia had actually united just before Italy moved into Aksum. Driven from Tigray, King Mangasha, Johannes' son, 
and General Alula traveled south to Shewa. A mile from Menelik's palace, they stopped and stripped bare to their waists and began the formal act of submission to their new emperor. The army without weapons and their clergy followed them. As they approached Menelik, they bowed to show the stones on their bare backs. Menelik's troops fired guns into the air. Drums beat and horns played. The two Tigrayan leaders placed the stones at the emperor's feet and prostrated themselves. The Aksum priests then came forward and all the leaders kissed the cross as a sign of peace. Mangasha's party asked for forgiveness, and Menelik replied simply that they were pardoned. Fifteen minutes of silence commenced to honor the moment, broken by the sound of artillery fire. Time was needed for gaining weapons and forging unity, and Menelik had gained it. Some historians even suspect the mistranslation of the Treaty of Wakala was no mistake. Indeed, McConan had every opportunity to understand and comprehend Italy's misunderstanding of the treaty when he visited Rome. Jonas calls the claims of mistranslation a convenient fiction. But now, having gained time, the leaders were united, creating an historic moment for modern Ethiopia. The Italians were unaware of the new development and still considered Menelik an ally more interested in arms than war. However, in examining papers seized from the crushed rebel Hagostafari and the fleeing Mangasha, Italian officials determined these opponents were not taking independent actions. Menelik had been directing their maneuvers all along with the intent of a later coordinated attack. The emperor had stayed silent for a long period, gaining time and momentum. But the game was up. The Italians saw the written evidence and now knew for certain he was their enemy, a monster they had created themselves after years of secret dealings. They thought they were creating rivals in Ethiopia, while Menelik was building an arsenal for the empire he would unite. Trumpets sounded from the top of the mounds in Addis Ababa. The emperor announced the gathering of his army. It was time to fight. The beating of war drums notified men across the country who gathered with their equipment for soldiering. Shield, lance, rifle, and ten days' supply of food, writes Jonas. Horns were filled with red pepper and butter. Cartridge belts were slipped over the shoulder or around the waist. Rifle muzzles were stuffed with scraps of wood or a rag to keep out dirt on the march. Swords were strapped to the right hip, following Ethiopian custom. All able-bodied men answered the call to arms. Enthusiasm was high, but how many men could the emperor muster? Rome believed it would not be enough. The Italians were sure that 30,000 troops were the most that Menelik could place on the Eritrean border, and were equally convinced that a trained force of 10,000 could easily handle that number. Menelik gave his war speech. Enemies have now come upon us to ruin the country, he proclaimed. Today, you who are strong, give me your strength, and you who are weak, help me by prayer. Now Menelik courted the Muslims, focusing on ethnicity rather than religion. I am black, and you are black. Let us unite to hunt our common enemy. The emperor's war council solidified. Members included Empress Tetu, considered second most powerful, Ross Makonan, the scholarly diplomat, Ross Alula, the famous general, and Ross Mangasha, the son of Emperor Johannes. Makonan, who had traveled to Rome to sign the Wakala Treaty, made a last effort to find peace with his Italian friends, asking for written confirmation from the emperor of the proclamation. Menelik responded immediately. I do not want to hear words of peace, he wrote, and ordered Makonan to deport all Italians from his cosmopolitan city of Harar. Makonan complied the next day. Tetu had long been a proponent of war. I am a woman and I do not love war, she told Menelik after learning about the treacherous treaty, but rather than accepting this, I prefer war. She was also suspicious of Makonan who was still holding out for peace. He was next in line for the throne. 
Might the Italians have targeted him as the rival they needed to pit against the emperor? As Europe had done before, by allying with the rivals of Tewodros and Johannes. With the submission of Alula and Mangasha, the leadership looked to be united. But the views of the Italians that betrayal was always a possibility could not be dismissed. Had not Menelik himself been willing to deal secretly? Soldiers gathered from across Ethiopia. They marched northward, led by Menelik and his generals. Although barefoot, they were far faster than any marching army in Europe. They covered 590 miles, longer than Napoleon's march to Moscow, and twice as long as Lee's march to Gettysburg or Sherman's march to the sea. Blocking the path was an Italian fort at Mekala. The emperor sent Maconan ahead with his division of several thousand to prevent the enemy from knowing the Ethiopian army's full numbers. Mekala was defended by only 1,000 Italians under Colonel Giuseppe Galliano. Ranking General Oresto Baratieri needed Mekala as a stalling tactic while he built up the Italians' major strategic fort a few miles north of Fort Mekala at the top of the mountains at Adagrat. With only 10,000 men, he could not afford to dispatch any more soldiers to Mekala. However, with each day, more soldiers arrived from Rome to increase his numbers at the Adagrat fortifications. The more Menelik and Maconan delayed, the stronger the Italian position. When Maconan approached the Mekale fort, Galliano could see that his numbers approached at least 30,000. The polite Maconan sent him a message. How are you? I am well, thanks be to God, wrote Galliano. Are your soldiers well? Mine are very well. Maconan responded, In the name of my emperor, I pray you leave this land. Otherwise, I will be forced to make war. It pains me to have to spill the blood of Christians. Please leave with your soldiers. Your friend, Maconan. Galliano believed the rumors that Maconan was open to betraying Menelik. His messages were laced with suggestions that Maconan should defect and become emperor himself. My king has ordered me to remain here and I will not move, Galliano told Maconan. Do what you have to do. I assure you I have fine rifles and very fine cannon. Several days later, Maconan asked Galliano for a doctor, a Lieutenant Mazzetti, to attend to his wounded from a previous skirmish. Galliano cordially agreed because he wanted secret information. He got it by serving generous portions of brandy to Otto Gorgios, the doctor's Ethiopian military escort, on his return to Fort Mekala. As Gorgias grew drowsy, he revealed that Menelik's army was in fact over 125,000. He also had artillery, and his aim was to enjoy a drink in the governor's palace in Masawa. In other words, Menelik's goal was to drive Italy not only from Tigray, but also from Africa entirely. Italian intelligence in Addis Ababa reported two Ethiopian armies totaling 12,000 each. Instead, Menelik organized one of the largest armies in African history. Jonas called it, quote, brilliant gamesmanship. Historian George Berkeley described it as unprecedented. Never, probably in the history of the world, has there been so curious an instance of a commander successfully concealing the numbers of his army and masking his advance behind a complete network of insinuation, false information, and circumstantial deceptions. Every village in every far-off glen of Ethiopia was sending out warriors in answer to the war drum. Now that he no longer needed to hide his numbers, the emperor marched his full army to Mekala to meet with Makonan. An Ethiopian prisoner of war had previously warned his captors, Menelik's soldiers, there are as many in number as the locusts. An Italian officer, who was the first to glimpse the size of the army, shouted, Sono molti, molti. There are many, many. And only part of Menelik's forces had arrived. To compensate, the Italians furiously added to their fortifications. 
the building of their Makale Fort started by utilizing a church for an ammunition depot. Churchyard tombstones were used for the foundation. A 230-foot wall was then built as the main defense, six feet thick at the top and 16 feet at the bottom. Previous battles had shown that the Ethiopians had no answer for the European style of fortified strongpoints. Even General Alula could not overcome their fortifications. The Dagali massacre he led took place in the open field. Menelik and the other leaders rebuked Makonan for taking so long. While he talked under a white flag and borrowed a doctor, several valuable days were given to the Italians to add soldiers to their main fort at Adagrat and finish the fortifications at Makala. As retribution, the War Council determined that Makonan's forces would be required to serve on the front line and lead the bloody invasion of the fort. The attack led to many casualties. Italian shattered glass below, ripping apart the bare feet of many Ethiopian soldiers. Makonan attacked again the next day with worse carnage and no sign of taking the fort. 1,000 men were blocking 125,000, Africa's largest army. Tetu and the council were whispering treason as the reason for Makonan's initial delay. What do I have to do to prove my loyalty, he pleaded. You gave them time to build the fort, they answered. It's up to you to take it down. After two more defeats, Makonan staged a night attack at 3 a.m., raising ladders into the fort. This plan looked to be successful, but the Italians were holding their fire. When they unloaded their cannons and rifles, 600 more Ethiopians lay dead. Makonan was ready to end his life and stood in front of the fort to be shot by the enemy. Instead, Ras Alula grabbed him and removed his fellow general from harm's way, writes Jonas. Coming from Alula, a critic of Makonan, this was a redemptive gesture. When the full council gathered, weeping could be heard throughout the camp. Menelik and Makonan faced each other, tears in their eyes. This is a sad day for Ethiopia, said the taciturn Menelik. After some silence, he simply said, This is my faithful subject. He stood and embraced his friend and ally. Never again would Makonan's loyalty be questioned. Menelik realized that these direct attacks would not work, so he initiated a siege and targeted the fort's water supply, some say at the suggestion of Tetu. It was a move that would be a trademark for Ethiopia in the future, sidestepping the direct assault for something more clever. Even the quenching of the spring outside the fort had its own foreshadowing of future victory tactics. Colonel Galliano flew the white flag. The emperor marched 1,000 Italian prisoners through two Ethiopian columns while the yellow, red, and green colors of Ethiopia were raised above the fort. Menelik's army was marching north toward Adagrat for the final confrontation between the full force of both armies. Chapter 5 During my initial visits to Ethiopia, I kept looking around for some coffee trees. I've been drinking at least two French press pots of coffee every day for over 20 years, supplied by my local roasting master, Ian Goodman, who gets his beans from around the world and often from Ethiopia. Coffee originated in the country's highlands. We were staying at a friend's house in an Ethiopian village, and I mentioned my need to see a coffee tree. He laughed and took me to the backyard, broke off a twig, and handed me some red berries. One of the more repeated local legends is told as follows. Around the 6th century AD, a shepherd named Caldi noticed his goats getting excited after eating the red berries off a certain plant. He tried them himself, felt the adrenaline, and took them to a local abbot. The berries have a large bean-shaped seed inside. The monks noticed that the berries helped them stay up during their all-night prayer vigils. The movement spread from there. 
Ethiopia gained coffee around the same time in history that she lost her Christian allies in Byzantium and Rome. Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity, today called Oriental Orthodox, along with Egyptian Copts, Armenians, and Christians in southern India, parts of Syria, and a few other places, split with the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics, at that time united, in A.D. 451, over bitter disputes regarding the two natures of Christ. Both groups, Eastern and Ethiopian Orthodox, were unbending regarding the teaching still honored today in Bible-believing Protestant churches that Christ was and is fully God and fully man. Both groups view St. Cyril of Alexandria as the great leader of this view. Cyril led the church's condemnation of Nestorius, who was proclaimed a heretic in A.D. 431, for teachings considered destructive to Christ as fully God. Cyril's famous phrase was, One incarnate nature of God the Word. But a monastic leader named Eutyches pushed it too far. Though a champion of Cyril's teachings, he was condemned 20 years after Nestorius for emphasizing the deity of Christ at the expense of Christ being fully man. Eutyches himself was proclaimed a heretic at the Council of Chalcedon in A.D. 451 by the Byzantine and Roman Orthodox. He was also condemned as a heretic by the Oriental Orthodox. So far, so good. But the two groups could not agree on the terminology of just exactly how these two natures of Christ reside in one person. The divine nature and the human nature are not mixing together, I was told by Girma Batu, vice academic dean of the leading Ethiopian seminary. But at the same time, they are united in a miraculous way. A noted scholar with the Orthodox Church in America believes the difficulties can be overcome. They are virtually the same as us, I was told in an interview with Archbishop Alexander Galitsyn, who taught patristics at Marquette University for 23 years and is the author of Mystagogy, a monastic reading of Dionysius Areopagita. The Archbishop described a series of colloquia between the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox starting in the 1960s. He said the scholars concluded that we really don't believe differently. We are not divided by the substance of the faith, the Archbishop said, but rather by which saints or saints which are anathematized, who is the patriarch of a certain area such as Alexandria and Syria, and certain specifics of the liturgy. He said the two churches in Syria, and also Egyptian Copts and Greeks, allow the faithful to commune in each other's churches when necessity requires, and weddings are recognized by both churches. However, many Eastern Orthodox take a different view on the Oriental Orthodox. Their mysteries are invalid, and they should be received as non-Orthodox, write the editors of the OCIC, the Orthodox Christian Information Center. Both sides agree that much confusion emerged over the definition of the term nature. The Eastern Orthodox used the term in two different ways, depending on the context, while the Orientals and today's Ethiopian Christians are what Archbishop Alexander calls terminological conservatives, sticking with one definition as used by St. Cyril in his famous formula, one incarnate nature of God the Word. But the OCIC editors reject the view that the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox split over semantics and misinterpretation and misunderstanding. They are concerned that this position leads to a view where the fathers of the Eastern Church were in error. Both Guillermo and his fellow professor, Jacob Jossi, have little expectation in the short term for unity between the two Orthodox camps in terms of celebrating communion together. Instead of formal unity, the goal for now should be, quote, functional unity, I was told by Dr. Jossi, who now heads the seminary for the Oriental Orthodox Church in India, a church founded by the Apostle Thomas. Unlike with Protestants and Catholics, where the divide with the Ethiopian church remains wide, meetings between hierarchs of the Eastern Orthodox are more common. 
the overseer of the leading seminary in Addis Ababa, Archbishop Timotiwos, or Timothy, told me he attended seminary in Russia and was classmates with current Russian Patriarch Kirill. The late Ethiopian Patriarch Paulos attended the prestigious Eastern Orthodox School in New York, St. Vladimir's Seminary. After the split in A.D. 451, the Eastern and Oriental churches grew far apart. Since then, what little interaction Ethiopia has enjoyed with the lands of Rome and Byzantium has largely involved trade. The primary export? Coffee. The coffee ceremony is a major phenomenon in Ethiopia, and I enjoyed several during each of my visits. I saw women on the streets with coffee ceremony setups like hot dog vendors at a ball game. But it's not fast food. Once I sat down, I was there for nearly two hours, enjoying the three rounds required by every ceremony. Traditionally, incense is lit and a prayer is said at the end for the barista. In Ethiopia's cosmopolitan areas, coffee shop chains serve all the espresso drinks that we are familiar with, and the largest chain has a green logo that looks a lot like the Starbucks trademark. I asked my friends about this logo. They said that Starbucks sued them, and it went all the way to the Ethiopian Supreme Court. They ruled against Starbucks on the basis that coffee was invented by Ethiopia. The supreme commander of the Italian army in Eritrea was the bespectacled General Oreste Baratieri, who also served as the governor and top political official. He made all of the decisions regarding Italy's occupation in Ethiopia, with overarching authority only from officials in Rome. Like the playwright Martini, his rise involved leadership in the Geographic Society, and he considered himself an amateur African ethnologist. He also admired King Leopold and his efforts in the Congo. He was a cerebral man who liked to use large words and complex grammar. However, he was not high-born like his three subordinate generals, the handsome Giuseppe Aramande, who had a beautiful Eritrean mistress, the regal but volatile Matteo Albertoni, the oldest of the generals, and the book-smart Vittorio Dabormida, a published author on military tactics. All three were aristocrats, unlike their superior, and all three favored aggressive action against Menelik. Baratieri, more hardened than his courtly generals, was wisely cautious and admired his African foe. Baratieri occupied the strategic town of Adagrat in March 1885. It sits on the highest point of the towering Ethiopian mountain range, part of the Great Rift Valley, the barrier that has kept invaders out for millennia. Water drains into the Red Sea from one side and flows to the Nile River on the other. The commander-in-chief for all of Italy's forces in Ethiopia chose to build at Adagrat the best fortifications Europe could design. Each day, more soldiers, supplies, weapons, and ammunition arrived from the homeland. Italian artillery had enormous killing capacity, as was demonstrated at Mekala. Some shells contained shrapnel, thousands of small metal pieces that burst just above the enemy soldiers' heads and killed dozens in one shot. Yes, they were outnumbered by Menelik's army but the Ethiopians' previously failed attempts to overcome Italian technology convinced Baratieri that his now 20,000-strong army was fully capable of defending Adagrat and defeating Menelik. Crucial to the effectiveness of the Adagrat fortress was keeping the enemy away from Adwa, a crossroads 40 miles to the west. The town sits next to the holy city of Aksum, just a few miles further than Adwa. Explaining military tactics can be complicated. As an analogy, consider the Ethiopians as an army from Texas seeking to reach Seattle, Washington. Seattle being Osmara and the coast of Eritrea. The direct route is through Denver at the base of the Rocky Mountains. Adagrat is Denver. 
However, the army could take a left and go westward on Route 66 through the mountains to Los Angeles and travel up to Seattle and miss most of the mountainous travel. Adois, west of Atagrat, and down in the valley is Los Angeles. Like Route 66, there's only one cut through the mountains to Adois. Baratieri was fully aware of this other option. In fact, he made sure that the Italian army secured Adois from the beginning of the occupation. But Parliament's budget cuts demanded that he trim down his military footprint, and Adois was left vacant. Nevertheless, the Italian general knew that Menelik would be crushed if he tried to take that western route, as it would expose the Ethiopian army's right flank, usually a terminal mistake in military tactics. Armies fight facing forward, just like people. An attack from the front is easily seen. But if someone can sneak up on you from the back or side, it is more difficult. With armies, their cannons and other artillery turn ever so slowly, and supply lines and other support units are also slow to make adjustments. As such, generals spend a lot of time making sure that they are never flanked. Menelik's barefoot army, 125,000 strong, marched with their rifles toward the heavily fortified Atagrat. As they approached, the Italian scouts noticed a movement from the straight path. Indeed, Menelik was making the westward turn toward Adois. He was exposing his right flank. Baratieri was immediately notified. However, the Italian commander never advanced to attack Menelik's right flank. The Ethiopian emperor knew exactly what he was doing. He placed at the rear of his army his 1,000 Italian prisoners from Fort Mekele, along with 13 officers and Colonel Giuseppe Galliano. For Baratieri, to destroy Menelik's flank meant destroying his own soldiers. The army traveled safely to Adwa. Two weeks later, Menelik released the 1,000 prisoners as he had promised to do when the Italians gave up the fort. He was now closer to Asmara, Seattle, than Baratieri. Atagrat sat alone, irrelevant. If Menelik chose to advance on defenseless Asmara and the nearby Masawa port city, then all of the soldiers at Atagrat would be left vulnerable and cut off from supplies, just as they were at Fort Mekela. Baratieri understood what had happened to him. He was now forced to conduct a humiliating retreat back to Asmara, or he could march to Adwa and face Menelik in the open field. Neither was a good option, although most of the Italians were confident that they would win with technology over numbers. It played well in Europe, wrote Jonas, where Menelik, always with an eye to international public opinion, could now add shrewd strategist to his reputation as a patient and peace-loving statesman. Was there anything else behind Menelik's move to Adwa? Yes, he once again avoided a direct confrontation with a clever move to outwit his opponent. Yes, his army had to move regularly to forage for food, and they had lingered a bit too long in front of Atagrat. But something else, something larger, something bigger than armies, may have played a role. The clergy of nearby Aksum eventually joined Menelik at Adwa. This is documented. It is also documented that some kind of version of the Ark of the Covenant was brought out for the upcoming great battle. Was it the Ark itself? Indeed, every bit of help was needed for the Ethiopians at this moment because the Italian generals met in emergency session and made their decision. The full strength of the Italian army would be attacking the Ethiopian army the next day in the open field at Adwa. The Ark of the Covenant, as described in the book of Exodus, is a chest created in approximately 1500 BC under the direction of Moses. God prescribed the Ark to be built 
according to the pattern shown you on the mountain, which made it a copy of the true one in heaven. See Exodus 25.40 and the book of Hebrews 9.24. God instructed it to be placed in the innermost part of the tabernacle and later the temple, the area called the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest of Israel can enter once a year to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people and himself. Famously, a rope was tied to his bare foot to drag him back out if the ark killed him. The ark's dimensions were approximately four feet long and two and a half feet high and wide, with permanently attached poles at the bottom, longer than the chest, for transportation by priests carrying the ark when necessary. It was covered in pure gold. The chest itself was constructed of acacia wood, which the Greek Septuagint translates as incorruptible wood. Two angels called cherubim sit on either side at the top of the ark, also covered with gold, with their wings stretching across the length, touching each other, and providing a seat for God himself. The scriptures describe in several places the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who sits above the cherubim. See 1 Samuel 4.4. 4. God's feet rest on the earth, which is his footstool. 1 Chronicles 28.2 and Psalm 132 verses 7 and 8. The ark represents the earth, and the cherubic seat represents the unseen, unknowable throne of God's actual presence in the dimension called heaven. Inside the ark were three items. One, the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, etched in stone. Two, a golden jar of manna, the supernatural bread that rained from heaven, feeding the Israelites for 40 years. And three, the flowery almond staff of Aaron, Moses' brother, the high priest, which blossomed supernaturally in a contest with competing clerics who challenged Aaron's leadership. The Hebrew word for ark is aron which means chest. Our word, ark, is derived from the Latin for chest, arca. We use the same word for Noah's ark, but the Hebrew word for Noah's boat is taba, a chest with connotations of a vessel on water, the same word used for the basket in which the infant Moses was placed. Moses was raised and trained in Egypt, and objects similar to the ark are known to Egyptologists tablets inscribing a pact between Ramses and Hattusilus were placed at the feet of their respective gods, Ra and Teshup. Wooden boxes lined with gold were standard artifacts of the religious furniture of the period, says a professor of Egyptology. King Tutankhamun's tomb included a similar chest with carrying poles and winged cherubim-like creatures at the top. At times, the religious chests were interchangeable with coffins. Synagogues use ark-like cases to hold their Torah scrolls, hidden from public sight by a curtain decorated with the two cherubim angels. Other religious objects carried on poles by the Egyptians had the same size as the chest, but resembled a small ship. This fact may have some relation to our English ark-ark conundrum, Curiously, Ethiopia's traditional text on the Ark of the Covenant also sometimes refers to it as the belly of a ship. The existence of Ethiopia is interrelated to that of the Ark of the Tabernacle, according to a church-approved source. It's so integrated into the nation's psyche that there's a replica of it in more than 20,000 Ethiopian Orthodox churches, writes Kay Corbett at World Net Daily. It is their source of strength, their reason for living. While skeptics wonder if the actual Ark is in Aksum, no one doubts the long history of the tradition. Oxford scholar Edward Ullendorf, perhaps the world's top expert on Ethiopia's biblical history, says the Ark has formed the centerpiece of the Ethiopian church service since time immemorial. A celibate monk guards the building Ethiopians point to for where the Ark is preserved, 
a smaller chapel that sits outside the St. Mary of Zion Church, originally built by Emperor Izena in the 4th century. The current guardian is Abba Gebra Meskel, who is 62 years old. He is especially chosen for this blessed duty to serve till the end of his life, according to a church publication. He is the heir to the office of Azarias, the son of the high priest Zadok, who was appointed by Solomon to accompany his son Menelik I on his return to Ethiopia. Once anointed, the guardian is forbidden for life to set foot outside the chapel grounds. Abba Gebra Meskel is 100% convinced it is the authentic Ark, says his colleague, the temple's deacon, Zemichael Barhani. It is not only the exact shape described in the Bible, but moreover, it shines with an enormous light. According to Oxford scholar Ullendorf, Solomon dreamed that a great light of brilliance, the Shekinah, the divine presence, had left Israel and moved to Ethiopia. Ullendorf was recounting the Ethiopian story of Solomon and Sheba and their son Menelik, preserved in the sacred Ethiopian text called the Kibra Nagast, which means glory of kings. A lengthy document, the size of a moderate book by today's standards, the Kibra Nagast tells of a woman beautiful of face and stature named Makeda. We know her as Sheba, the queen of Ethiopia. Makeda means not thus. Not thus is it good for us to worship the sun, but it is right to worship God, she ultimately tells Solomon. So many questions arise with the Ethiopian premise. How did they get the ark from Israel back to Ethiopia? If they stole it, why didn't anybody notice? Under what circumstances did Solomon have sexual relations with Sheba? Is there any suggestion in the Bible that this happened? Let's start with what we know from the Bible, the primary passage being from 1 Kings. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, she was overwhelmed. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. 1 Kings chapter 10 Jesus describes Sheba's visit in the 12th chapter of Matthew. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. This is the basic information we have on the queen of Sheba. The Kibra Nagast retells the biblical story in great length, along with many other added details and a host of other fascinating bits of theology and mysticism unrelated to the story. According to this traditional Ethiopian text, while sleeping with Sheba, King Solomon dreamed of a brilliant sun shining with exceedingly great splendor over Israel. It suddenly withdrew itself and it flew away to the country of Ethiopia, and it shone there with exceedingly great brightness forever, for it willed to dwell there. We will address the events leading to their bedroom scene in a moment. But according to tradition, Sheba was impregnated and returned to Ethiopia to give birth to their son Menelik, whose name means son of the king. Menelik ceded Ethiopia's millennia of Solomonic emperors, and launched Solomon's Old Testament religion. Menelik did this after returning to Israel as a young man to visit his father. Solomon was very pleased with him, as he resembled his own father, David. After four years, Solomon begrudgingly approved of Menelik's ambition to return to Ethiopia and rule there. 
always conscious of continuing his seed into the future, Solomon gathered together his counselors and his officers and the elders of his kingdom. Come, O ye counselors and officers, let us give him your firstborn children, and we shall have two kingdoms. So, several hundred of the best sons of the nobles and priests accompanied Menelik back to Ethiopia, including Azariah, son of the high priest Zadok. Here the story takes an interesting turn. And the children and the nobles of Israel who were commanded to depart with the son of the king took counsel together, saying, What shall we do? For we have left our country and our birthplace. But Azarias answered them with a larger problem. They were leaving the ark, which throughout the Kiber Nagast is referred to without explanation as Lady Zion. Let us sorrow on account of our Lady Zion, replied Azarias, for they are making us leave her. The nobles agreed. Verily, she is our lady and our hope and our object of boasting, and we have grown up under her blessedness. And how is it possible for us to forsake Zion, our mistress? Earlier, Menelik had asked his father only for a portion of the fringe of the covering of the tabernacle to take back with him. But the priest Azarias had larger ambitions. Let us take our lady Zion, he said. An angel of the Lord, later identified as Michael the archangel, appeared in the night and gave Azarias the plan. He was instructed to go into the Holy of Holies of the temple with three other men, take the ark, and replace it with scrap wood. The four men did as they were told and found all the doors of the temple and the Holy of Holies wide open for them. Azarias left the fake wood in the vacant spot and covered it with the ark's purple cloth veils. They left with no one noticing. In a reverse pattern, the flight home of Menelik and his nobles is reminiscent of Israel's flight from Egypt, where the best sons have been lost and the Red Sea is miraculously crossed. And Michael marched in front as they traveled above the ground to the height of a cubit. Menelik did not learn of the theft until they left. No one in Israel was aware of the stolen ark. When Zadok came to Solomon, the king was, quote, sorrowful. He recounted to the high priest his dream of the sun moving from Israel to Ethiopia. Verily, the sun that appeared to me long ago while I was sleeping with the queen of Ethiopia was the symbol of the lady Zion. He asked if Zadok was sure that the ark was still in its place, and the priest replied that the ark is always covered by veils. Solomon told him to go back and check immediately. Zadok found there nothing except the wooden boards which Azariah had fastened together and had made to resemble the sides of the pedestal of Zion. When Zadok saw this, he fell forward on his face and became like a dead man. Upon telling Solomon, the king had only one solution to the incident, cover it up. Who would know, since only Zadok was allowed to see the ark? Woe to me, for my glory hath departed. My father prophesied concerning them, Solomon said, alluding to Sheba's people. He then quotes his father David from Psalm 68, 31. Ethiopia shall stretch out her hands to God. What about the question of Menelik's conception? Did Sheba and Solomon really have a son? The Kibra Nagas provides a long and interesting narrative of the encounter. Solomon gained permission to sleep in the same chamber as Sheba, but in different beds, as long as he promised not to touch her. He agreed to that condition, provided that she agree not to steal anything in his palace, to which she also swore an oath. At dinner... He secretly fed her a potion that makes one very thirsty. In the middle of the night, she got up, agonizing for a drink of water. She found a convenient pitcher nearby and lifted it to drink a large amount. Solomon grabbed her hand, accusing her of stealing from him, for nothing is more valuable than water. 
Verily thou hast now become my wife, according to the law of kings, he said to her. And she gave herself into his embrace willingly, and yielded to his desire, according to that which she had covenanted with him. Oxford's Ullendorf believes they did have sexual relations. He notes, The queen came to Solomon and communed with him of all that was in her heart. 1 Kings 10.2 The Hebrew term to come, enter, is also used as the technical term for coitus. Ullendorf here references Genesis 16.2, where Sarah tells Abraham, Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children by her. Ullendorf continues. In 1 Kings 10.13, we are told that Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire. Ullendorf notes that this statement infers a consummation. He adds that renowned Middle Ages scholar Rabbi Shlomo Rashi tries to equate all her desire with wanting wisdom. But... The very fact that Rashi felt impelled to stress this aspect demonstrates quite clearly that he was aware of less innocent embellishments to this verse. As we shall see later, many questions remain in the scholarly community regarding the existence of the Ark and the possibility of it residing in Ethiopia. But beyond the quibbling of what is or is not literal, the Ark as a theological concept and Old Testament shadow still works quite effectively for Christian worship today. Ullendorf agrees with the Ethiopians that the Eucharist table in the liturgy alludes to the Ark. St. Germanus, the great 9th century theologian whose commentary at one time accompanied every liturgy book in Europe, agrees with the Ark's representation as the altar table. Moreover, Every Eucharist table in traditional Christianity contains the three elements inside the Ark. One, the Ten Commandments are replaced with the Gospel book. Two, the manna is the bread of the Eucharist. And three, the blossoming staff is the wooden cross atop every altar table. Seasonally, like blossoms, the cross is decorated with flowers for certain feasts. In Orthodox churches, the altar area is modeled after the few glimpses of ultimate reality or heaven given to us in Scripture, where, like above the earthly ark throne, cherubim are constantly giving glory to God. The liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, used by both Ethiopians and Eastern Orthodox, makes the cherubic cry of holy, holy, holy a constant refrain. A cloud is another constant, consisting of incense below and a cloud of angels above. There are six or seven places in the scriptures that depict the ultimate presence of God, including the passages of Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1, where, quote, the temple was filled with smoke, and an immense cloud with flashing lightning was joined by mighty angels who sing continually, holy, 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 in the presence of God. In Revelation 4 and 5, we see the same throne scene. Angelic beings send incense up to the throne and never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Then the Apostle John sees Christ move from the right hand of him who sat on the throne to the center of the throne where he offers himself as the new sacrifice. According to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is now the high priest, quote, at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. The liturgy here on earth reflects the ongoing, eternal liturgy taking place in heaven. Ethiopian and other Orthodox liturgical traditions reflect not only the heavenly pattern of worship, but also the key event in history. At the resurrection, two angels, or cherubim, sit at either side of the coffin, altar, ark, where Jesus was laid. That very slab serves today as the preparation table for the Eucharist at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. 
like the altar table of a holy church, Ethiopians believe the related object of the ark itself has supernatural powers. In the Old Testament, Israel won battles when the ark was brought out for such extraordinary occasions. Joshua's army defeated the mighty city of Jericho after the ark was marched around its walls seven times. The Jordan River parted for crossing when the ark-bearing priests stepped into the water. When Uzzah reached out to balance the ark as it looked to be toppling over, he was struck dead in judgment. Jewish commentaries speak of others killed by the sparks emitted from the ark. When the ark was held for a time at the house of Obed-Edom of Gath, Scripture tells us that Yahweh blessed Obed-Edom and his whole family, 2 Samuel 6.11. Jewish tradition tells us that this included being blessed with many children, including six being born at one time. Many Ethiopians believe the power of the ark is responsible for Aksum erecting what some call the largest piece of stone ever successfully quarried and erected in the ancient world. This greatest of Aksum obelisks, now broken from a fall, was placed in the early centuries not more than 100 yards from the chapel of the ark guardian. How do you think it was raised up? The Guardian of the Ark, asked author Graham Hancock, according to his 1991 book, The Sign and the Seal. Hancock confessed that he did not know. The Ark was used, whispered the monk darkly, according to Hancock's penchant for drama. The Ark and the Celestial Fire, men alone could never have done such a thing. According to the Kibra Nagast, the archangel Michael said he was, quote, commanded by God to be with the ark forever. Menelik, leaving Israel, was quick to take advantage of this heavenly warrior's presence and use the ark as a battle help as soon as he re-entered his country. He had trouble with the city government and with the ark's help, laid waste the district and blotted out the people and slew them with the edge of the sword. The ark has a mind of its own. When the Philistines captured it and placed it in a pagan temple, the idol of Dagon was found the next day on the ground bowing before the ark. Propped back up, the next morning it bowed down again, only this time with its hands and head broken off. 1 Samuel 5 After this incident and a series of calamities, the Philistines hitched the ark to some animals, which by instinct headed immediately back to Israel. The Kibra Nagast agrees that the ark has a volatile nature. It goeth of its own free will wherever it wisheth, and it cannot be removed from its seat if it doth not desire it. In that light, as we return to the invasion of Ethiopia by the Italians in the 1890s, the clergy of Aksum and Emperor Menelik II couldn't just take the ark outside of its hiding place for the Battle of Adwa simply because they wanted to. The ark must agree. Did they bring it out? Iconography of the Battle of Adwa depicts priests carrying an ark, just as we would have imagined Israel to do against its enemies. We do know that at least two replicas of the Ark were brought out for the Battle of Adwa, the Tabat of St. George and the Tabat of St. Mary. But according to another account from Graham Hancock, it was the Ark itself that was used at Adwa. He asked the question to an Ethiopian archpriest serving as a missionary to the British, the very Reverend Lika Barhanat Solomon Gabra Selassie. Hancock, who defaulted on just calling him Solomon, said his beard was as long as his name. Father Solomon was specific with his written answer to Hancock's question. Yes, he said, it had been used over the centuries as a source of strength against the aggressors, as on the day when Joshua carried the ark around the city of Jericho. Likewise, our priests carried the ark, chanting and going into battle in the glory of God. Then he got more specific. As recently as 1896, when the King of Kings Menelik II fought against the Italian aggressors at the Battle of Adwa in Tigray region, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant into the field 
to confront the invaders. Many Ethiopians themselves do not believe the Ark itself was used for the Battle of Adwa. They believe the original is too sacred. No, I do not believe it was the original Ark, said theology student Frey Salib. According to historical sources, priests went out carrying the Tabat of St. George. The March 1st battle happened to be on the feast day of St. George on the church calendar, so no one doubts his Tabat was used that day. Based on current available sources, it is impossible to confirm if the actual Ark of the Covenant, the golden chest used in battle by the Israelites, was brought out for the Battle of Adwa. Perhaps the results of the battle can provide a clue. Chapter 6 I was about to fly from Addis to Aksum. I met with the chairman emeritus of the history department of Addis Ababa University, Ethiopia's largest academic site, and asked him where to visit. His first recommendation was the Abba Garima Monastery, named after St. Garima, which preserves the oldest illustrated gospel book in the world, written in Ethiopia's ancient script called Ge'ez. According to the Acts of Garima, the saint copied all four gospels and drew the illustrations in one day. The sun stopped to make a longer day for him to complete the task. The book has healing powers and is read to the sick. When I got there, an armed guard stood outside the simple little structure housing the 1,600-year-old Grima Gospels written on goatskin. One little monk watched us in the dimly lit 300-square-foot building while my guide and I leaned over the ancient book on top of a small table just under some glass. We were inches away. Scholars and scientists previously agreed that the Gospels were written centuries after Garima's death, write the authors of Abyssinian Christianity. However, recent radiocarbon dating carried out by Oxford University suggests a date between A.D. 330 and 650 for their creation, opening the possibility that the Gospels were actually copied by Abba Garima himself. The Los Angeles Review of Books repeats this discovery, and exclaims in a 2017 article, For anyone interested in the history of the Bible, this is very big news. I have seen some of the ancient Bibles in Britain. The Garima Gospels are older than the Lindisfarne Gospel, as well as the renowned Irish Book of Kells. It is only preceded by the Codex Sinaiticus in the British Museum, a 3rd to 4th century work, the world's oldest complete volume of the Old and New Testament discovered in Sinai, Egypt. However, it is now divided between monasteries and museums in Egypt, Britain, Russia, and the United States. The entire Garima Gospels have remained in one piece, in the same spot, for almost two millennia. When some Anglo-French scholars got wind of the Garima Gospels in 1950, they sent a team to inspect it. The chief scholar, Beatrice Plain, was not allowed to go inside, so the Gospels had to be brought out to the parking lot for her to examine. I was more fortunate. Not only was I male, I had a nice beard, and that is high currency among Ethiopians, especially monastics. I was able to interview their top scholar, Father Abraham, about my aim to write a history of their nation. The founders of Ethiopia descended from Noah, he told me. It begins from Noah. That is important. When Emperor Menelik gave his rousing war speech to begin the Great March from Addis Ababa to Tigray, he warned that the Italians had come to, quote, change our religion and then asked for the earnest prayers of all devout Christians in Ethiopia. Historian Makila says that the Italian politicians talked of Rome's civilizing mission, its duty to bring enlightenment and Catholicism to a region firmly in the clutches of the Orthodox Church. General Baratieri's vision for the Italian colony he administered involved a societal overhaul. 
there would be churches, schools, clinics, Italian language classes, an entire cultural infrastructure. He was patient and far-sighted. For this reason and others, he leaned toward a retreat from the heavily fortified Adagrat, no longer relevant, back to Eritrea's Masawa port, closer to his supply lines, and in a better position to defend if Menelik were to attack. His generals disagreed. When they see us, they will scamper off, said General Matteo Albertoni, the impetuous aristocrat, to one of his officers. Others referred to the Ethiopians as effeminate. For Menelik's part, he was not interested in tangible proofs of masculinity. Bring me the man, not the testicles, he commanded his soldiers, continuing to Wodros's prohibition of castrations. From his experience with the Mekala fort, he knew the value of a live prisoner. Baratieri gathered his generals around a small table in his tent for a final strategy session the day before the battle. He had hoped to confirm his notions for a retreat. Instead, they all lobbied for an attack, starting with Matteo Albertoni, volatile and intemperate, the eldest at 56. The handsome Giuseppe Aramande shared Albertoni's concerns that the soldiers were tired of waiting around and not fighting. The military writer Vittorio Dabermida, who had not yet seen conflict, lifted his prized white-handled saber passionately and said that the soldiers would never understand a retreat and instead must attack. Baratieri laid his glasses on the table and told them that he would consider their opinions. Baratieri's delays disgusted the elegant Aramondi, who enjoyed a local mistress and needed no other outlet. Rather, he mocked Baratieri's unfruitful fortification of Adagrat as the onanism of the military arts. The biblical onan spilled his seed on the ground, quote-unquote, rather than obediently impregnating his wife. In Rome, cooler heads did not prevail. That day, Baratieri received a telegram from the prime minister who said that the Secretary of the Treasury needed a quick victory or their efforts may break the bank. We are ready for any sacrifice to save the honor of the army and the prestige of the monarchy, he wrote. The telegram helped tip the scales. That evening, Baratieri gave the order to his generals. They would descend the mountains and advance on the small plain of Adwa at midnight, March 1st. His words were specific. It would be an advance, not an attack. Baratieri believed that the advantage would go to the prepared defenders, and he wanted Menelik to attack him instead. It was a game of chicken, and the stakes were increasing, as the emperor had plans to evacuate the next day, March 2nd, for other places to forage. Menelik described his army as starving, according to one account. Who would attack whom, if ever? there existed a small window for Menelik to entice Baratieri into his trap. Italian ambition assisted him. The regal generals under Baratieri's command knew combat was the place to advance higher both in rank and in politics. Many historians suspect this motive was behind their arguments for an attack. Others wonder if subsequent events that led to an attack were part of a collusion. As for the soldiers, they were in high spirits. Rumors swirled that Menelik's generals would betray him. Estimates of the Ethiopian numbers were deflated. To keep spirits high, the soldiers received daily rations of wine, coffee, rum, and tobacco. Come, Abyssinians, we'll help you find the road to hell, said one of those soldiers, enjoying the rations. Officers shared bottles of Chianti. Long live Italy! Long live the king! Attitudes rarely were based on all the information. Just before the previous siege of Fort Mechale, Colonel Galliano, on the verge of surrender, wrote General Baratieri, Morale is as high as it can be. General Albertoni, the oldest, was selected to lead the advance with his 4,000 men. But Aramandi's and Dabormida's divisions were nearby, to prevent the classic military mistake of dividing an army. Albertoni's subordinate, Domenico Torito, reached a strategic pass more quickly than expected. 
When Albertoni caught up, he asked his subordinate why he had stopped. Torito replied that he had reached his destination. Albertoni looked at his map and declared Torito was wrong. The destination was miles further. In fact, the map was wrong. Albertoni could have sent a courier to his superior, Baratieri, to clarify, as there was no hurry. Instead, he rashly told Torito, Go ahead, I don't want any hesitation. He followed this order with a statement that would cause Torito to throw caution to the wind. You're not afraid, are you? A few hours later, Torito was leading half of Albertoni's army down a winding mountain path under moonlight. It would have been much wiser to wait for daybreak so that he could see the myriad of Ethiopian tents in the valley just below him. But the general had questioned his courage. At 5.30 a.m., he stumbled into the enemy camp itself, and the Battle of Adwa began. Italy's army was divided. Menelik's headquarters were located at Adwa's Abba Garima Monastery, home of the Garima Gospels. Reports confirmed that the emperor and empress, along with the generals, were in church at 4 a.m., the morning of the attack. An anonymous Ethiopian soldier later gave an account of the emperor and his wife being deep in prayer when notified of the attack at 4 a.m. Piously, Menelik waited until the service was over to notify his troops to be ready for battle at 5.30 a.m. The delay on Menelik's part is rightly questioned by historians, but there can be no doubt they were in prayer at 4 a.m. This was Sunday morning. And all Ethiopian Orthodox Christians, even today, begin divine liturgy services around 3 a.m., if not earlier, and worship through the night. Liturgy ends closer to 8 a.m., so Menelik certainly did not wait to finish communion once he was informed. This divine liturgy service taking place at the famous monastery included clergy from the nearby city of Aksum. In short order, the clergy and their arcs, real or replicas, chose to follow the soldiers. Reports confirm that the Holy Communion was served just behind the battle lines, suggesting that the interrupted worship service continued on the field. Priests appeared, blessing the assembled troops and hearing confessions. Menelik, Tetu, and their generals also received the bread and wine of communion on the field. The flag was raised toward the icon of Christ. Empress Tetu stood on the field and acted like a warrior, encouraging her 5,000 soldiers. Don't give an inch, she cried. The Italians had less than 20,000 men against Menelik's more than 100,000. The Italians were outnumbered, but the time to demonstrate technological superiority was at hand. Ethiopian artillery had been featured against the fort at Mekele, but was useless against the walls. However, the same quick-firing French-made 57mm Hotchkiss batteries proved highly effective in the open field and fired even further than the Italian guns. The Ethiopian infantry conducted a frontal assault. The Italian artillery was able to repel them, but not with the kind of carnage that a fortified position like Adigrat would have availed. A second and then a third wave of Ethiopian soldiers attacked. The mathematics were unassailable, as Menelik knew. Like the Union Army against the Confederates, overwhelming numbers would surely win the day. Ethiopia had numbers. One Italian officer counted 100 multicolored Ethiopian flags while hearing beating war drums throughout the valley. Colonel Giuseppe Galliano, the captured commander at Fort Mekele, was back with the Italian Army and guarding Albertoni's vulnerable right flank. He was impressed by the effectiveness of the Ethiopian artillerymen. After firing a long shot, an adjustment was made, and then the next short volley was finally corrected to fire just right. Their precision caused Galliano to insist that they were not operated by Ethiopians. It's impossible that they are not Europeans, he concluded. Menelik's patience after years of weapons acquisition and training was finally paying off. Ethiopian infantrymen were also at no disadvantage. While Emperor Johannes attacked the Italians with ancient muzzle loaders, Menelik had equipped his entire army with modern rifles. 
popular sources highlight spear-carrying Ethiopians at Adwa. But if any of the soldiers were in fact without guns, they were put in reserve. While romantic, the spear image reduces the real truth of Adwa, that an African army was using both wits and muscle. However, the Ethiopians did fight with bare feet. The mass of Africans began to swarm every side of the divided Italians. Not only was Albertoni divided from half of his own army in front of him, led by Torito, but no general behind him could reinforce Albertoni's rear, since the Ethiopians had wedged between them. Albertoni identified a very effective and strategic spot between two small mountains that he felt was impossible for either army to climb, but soon he saw barefoot Ethiopians scaling both hills. The Ethiopian Oromo Calvary entered the fray with their fearsome lion's mane headdresses. They collected scrotums on their saddles. And word reached the Italian soldiers that Menelik's order to bring me the man, not the testicles, was only being lightly followed. Reputedly, the cavalry only castrated those soldiers who kept firing their weapons. So a number of accounts describe soldiers tossing their rifles, quote, like madmen, before they were captured. A lieutenant pastore shot himself with his revolver to avoid such disgrace. Another man jumped off a cliff, a cigarette still in his mouth. Albertoni's division was destroyed. Colonel Giuseppe Galliano, having just returned from Fort Mechele, was killed, attempting to protect the impulsive general's flank. Albertoni himself was taken prisoner. Baratieri had three more divisions. The closest army to the current crisis was led by the handsome general Aramondi. As the Ethiopian soldiers approached, one of his men shouted, They won't get away today! He turned around to find his general sitting on the ground with his head in his hands. Aramondi was killed shortly after. It was no longer a fight, but a slaughterhouse, wrote a surviving officer. The initial attacking battalion under Torito was completely destroyed by 8.15 a.m. Aramondi was dead. Albertoni was captured. The published tactical expert, General Dabermida, experiencing his first taste of combat, was left alone for a time. After a lull, some of his soldiers believed that the battle was over and they had won. They ran around, firing guns and shouting, Viva la Italia, victory! But soon they too were flanked and overwhelmed by the enemy. The booksmart general was killed and stripped naked. His white-handled saber was taken to Menelik as a war prize. Instead of the Ethiopian generals turning on each other, it was the Italians who failed to follow instruction. Albertoni was ordered to advance, not attack. His colleagues were instructed to allow no gap in the army as Albertoni moved forward. Neither order was followed. In fact, some question whether the three generals colluded against their overly cautious supreme commander and agreed to confront the enemy that day rather than allow for more delay. One man who was later a prisoner with Albertoni, Lieutenant Gerardo Pontano, claimed that the general said to him, You are young and have a better chance of returning to Italy. Remember well what your general is telling you. Tell them that General Baratieri was betrayed by his officers. Italy lost 70% of its approximately 18,000-man army to casualties, dead, wounded prisoners. Over 6,000 were killed, one-third of Baratieri's army. Though the death count was similar for Ethiopia, it amounted to less than one-tenth of its army. Out of 610 Italian officers, 352 were killed. Effectively, the battle was won by 9.30 a.m. Baratieri survived, but was forced to retreat. His papers and correspondence fluttered across the valley as he struggled to navigate the small rocky path. Adding to his humiliation, his glasses were destroyed in the chaos, and he was reduced to being guided by an assistant. Horrendous and colossal slaughter, proclaimed the headlines when the news hit Rome. 
Ethiopian soldiers spent the rest of the day stripping the dead of all their clothes, possessions, coins, rations, and anything of value. Ethiopian soldiers received no pay, so this was standard compensation. That night, the campfires abounded with songs, drums, and celebrations. A glorious procession took place on March 3rd. Priests with their tabats were followed by musicians. The parade included the generals and Empress Tetu. Then Emperor Menelik II was cheered as, quote, the man who engineered modern Africa's greatest military triumph, according to Adwa historian Raymond Jonas, and one of the greatest military victories of all time. Menelik and Tetu catapulted to celebrity status in Europe and the United States. Sons were named Menelik. Both were pictured on the front of major newspapers, and Menelik was featured on the cover of Vanity Fair, the day's Time magazine. He shared this honor with Charles Darwin, the Tsar of Russia, and other notables. Africa's Christian monarch, he was heralded. Menelik and his military secured Ethiopian independence for more than a generation. They also gave a stunning lesson to would-be conquerors, wrote Jonas. Ethiopia's victory established its status as one of the great African nations and announced the end of an era in which foreign powers could colonize African territory at will. Or, as Italian survivor Captain Mario Bossi put it, Adwa was the beginning of the end of the colonial farce. African Americans were also triumphant. W.E.B. Du Bois called for a new African state, which would include Negroes, and proposed the name Ethiopian Utopia. His fellow activist, J.A. Rogers, said Adwa amazed Europe and heartened black men everywhere. The Battle of Adwa was the battle for Africa, concluded Jonas. Over the next hundred years, European domination would gradually unravel. The history of African sovereignty in the modern world started at Adwa. Menelik was triumphant, but he also gave shrewd consideration to the wild rejoicing by some and not others across the West. Like his isolated mourning after the Degali massacre and its reverberations back in Europe, the emperor feared blowback. The screaming headlines by Italian newspapers of disaster and carnage inspire not only compassion, but also revenge. The Chicago Tribune reported that Italy would widen the draft and double its efforts for conquest. Vengeance was a visceral theme. In fact, Menelik's top general, Ras Alula, architect of the Degali massacre, requested permission for a cavalry attack as victory unfolded at Adwa. Menelik denied approval. This decision prevented the deaths of several thousand more Italians and a likely near annihilation of the entire army. Historians, in hindsight, wonder if the emperor was avoiding another Alula-led Degali massacre. Similarly, Menelik was criticized for not continuing his attack all the way to the coast of Eritrea, which Italy continued to occupy. Today, Menelik's choice to head home victorious after Adwa is lauded by most historians as far-sighted. He had a plan. The Ethiopians took 1,900 prisoners, a massive number in proportion to the Italian army, and an indisputable public relations nightmare for Rome. Menelik was embarking on the return trip of the longest major military march in modern history, and he needed his rear protected. Like with Galliano and the Mekala prisoners, Ethiopia's new prisoners would serve that purpose. More importantly, when he reached Addis Ababa, the emperor would have the great bargaining chip he needed to sign a lasting peace treaty with Italy and Europe. After divvying up the prisoners to various generals and leaders as the armies headed in various directions, Menelik's main army kept 800 Italian captives. The rest he charged to be treated correctly. Bring them back to me alive, he ordered. In fact, the treatment of the prisoners would be important. Too cruel a hand and the propaganda wars in Europe would be lost, and perhaps the thirst for vengeance rekindled enough to ruin the gains at Adwa. 
50 prisoners died on the 10-week trip that distanced 600 miles along a winding path from the same causes as many Ethiopians died, hunger, exposure, wounds. Not every overseer was as level-headed as Menelik, as this long march was one of the first times that Africans had the position to rule over white colonialists. In some cases, at watering holes, the Ethiopians drank first, then the animals, then the Italians. Stragglers were beaten, and the troublemakers were hit in the crotch area. People in villages came out in droves to see the first white men they had ever encountered. Some called them Turks, and many held cloths up to their nose to block the odor. According to many Italian accounts, the Ethiopians believed white people gave off a distinct and disagreeable odor. One Italian officer gave his shirt for a chicken, though to the Ethiopians' credit, both groups received the same rations, a few chickpeas and barley each day. Some desperate prisoners found a dead mule and ate the entire thing, including the intestines. At night, the mostly unclothed men slept next to each other, quote, like sardines, in the bitter cold with no tents or blankets. They switch sides every few minutes in unison to make it through the night. While these circumstances were awful, they were understandable, and not too different from what the Ethiopians themselves were suffering. The bigger problem for Menelik and public perception was the castrations. Of the 1,900 prisoners taken, approximately 7% were known to have been emasculated. A far greater percentage of those soldiers left dead on the field had been castrated to acquire war trophies. Giovanni Tedoni, a captive, provides details on these ugly events on the day of the battle. He approached a wounded, stripped, and naked colleague who called out to him, and in a gesture of modesty, covered his genitals with his hand to conceal the wound created by his emasculation, which had taken the scrotum but not the penis. It left only a yellowish patch, and little blood was involved, he said. Two lateral cuts, and then a cut from the bottom up, and that's it. Another soldier tells of walking past a pile of bodies and hearing a cry for water. He saw one of ours in the pile who was dying and, horrible to say it, emasculated. One pile of 40 dead Italians was buried, and the report said 20 of them had been castrated. The Aromo Calvary decorated their horses' necks with daisy-chain scrotums. Italian prisoners saw scrotums on lances and shields. Tadoni's host, when he made it back to Addis Ababa, told him, At Adwa, I killed eight Italians, and I castrated them. Then he revealed a necklace under his shirt with the evidence. Jonas spends a page explaining that castration is not completely foreign to Europe. Parliament castrated the perpetrators of the gunpowder plot in 1605 in England, and a Protestant leader was castrated during the St. Bartholomew massacres in France. He adds that most lynchings in Jim Crow America involved castration. For many Ethiopian soldiers, the motive for castration was collecting trophies. Others did it for more symbolic reasons. The Abyssinians explained themselves, wrote a Dutch observer on the march, by saying that this is how they bring a halt to the enemy's capacity to reproduce. In spite of all the laws and edicts, he added, Menelik can do nothing to abolish this ignoble practice. On the positive side, good relations were beginning to develop between captor and captive. When they arrived in Addis Ababa, each prisoner was assigned to a host family. Unable as a practical manner to survive outside the city, they were allowed to roam free. Prisoners later wrote of the abiding memories of kindness they received from their hosts. One prisoner was unable to buy a journal of a fallen comrade for sale at a flea market. His host, Otto Gabriel, bought it for him. Prisoner Francisco Frasina sent back to his host soap, canned fruit, cigars, and liquor. He said that he couldn't do enough for the man who was, quote, like a father, and he promised that he would never be erased from his heart. Many Ethiopians became close friends with Italians. Others became lovers. Writes Jonas, 
It was a racial turning of the tables that put whites at the mercy of blacks in significant numbers for the first time, opening the door to retaliation and cruel revenge that never came. These friendships and love stories at the end of the journey apparently overcame whatever damage the initial cruel treatment had engendered. At the diplomatic level, Menelik was able to make a formal treaty with Italy, which included a return of all the prisoners, including General Matteo Albertoni. The Treaty of Addis Ababa, signed on October 23, 1896, stated that the former Treaty of Wicala is and will remain definitely annulled. Italy recognized absolutely and without reserve the independence of the Ethiopian Empire. Once again, Ethiopia had preserved her reputation as a country never conquered. As one established author wrote, Ethiopia is considered the longest-lived independent Christian nation in world history. Eight weeks after Adwa, a team of priests, unarmed soldiers, and relatives of General Aramandi returned to the battlefield to bury their dead. Most bodies were unidentifiable, as they had been stripped naked and some burned. Others had been ravaged by vultures and hyenas. Of the dead, 2,000 soldiers were in decent enough condition for burial, including the body of General Dabermita. General Aramandi's body was never found. Before they left, the group erected a monument and offered a mass. Forty years later, Italy placed another monument at the Adwa battlefield, a bust of fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, recent invader of Eritrea and Tigray, who was leading the largest fighting force ever assembled on the African continent. Soon to become Hitler's top ally, Mussolini brought to Ethiopia 476,000 men, 500 tanks, 350 aircraft, 1,500 artillery pieces, and 15,000 machine guns. The year was 1935, and Italy had not forgotten. For the lack of a few thousand men, we lost the day at Adwa, Mussolini said as he prepared to conquer Addis Ababa. We shall never make that mistake. Chapter 7 In the eleventh chapter of the book of Revelation, after a thousand years of disappearance from Scripture, the Ark of the Covenant reappears with much grandeur. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. What is happening in these verses? How would Ethiopians interpret this passage? Does it refer to the ark claimed to be in their country? Why is the ark in Ethiopia hidden? Why can no one see it? Many may think that the reason relates to the question of the proof of its existence, and that is why it is not kept in a museum for viewing. But there may be other reasons. The ark is only a relic. I was told by a top theologian of the Ethiopian church. It's just a relic, a theology student told me. Christ is worshipped. In fact, for those with eyes to see, the ark is everywhere in Ethiopia. This is the case because they believe the true ark, the fulfillment of everything the ark stands for, is Mary, the mother of Christ. The verse in Revelation 11 that mentions the ark for the first time in the New Testament is followed by this verse. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Ethiopians believe this is Mary, the fulfillment of the ark, the greater sign that the ark foreshadowed. Many church fathers agree. Athanasius the Great, Christianity's leading defender of the Trinity controversy in the 4th century, wrote, O noble virgin, truly you are greater than any other greatness. You are the ark, 
in which is found the golden vessel containing the true manna, that is, the flesh in which divinity resides. Everywhere you look in Ethiopia, you see an icon of Christ or Mary, often both of them. She is in every house, in every church, on buses, on taxis, and around people's necks. Of the approximately 25,000 churches in the country, 15,000 of them are named after the Virgin Mary. Is this a Catholic influence? Besides the Italians, the Catholics were driven out in the 1500s amid Portuguese attempts to evangelize Orthodox Ethiopia. Devotion to Mary existed long before they arrived. I was told by theology professor Germa Batu that when the Jesuit missionaries came to Ethiopia in the 16th century, one of their missionary leaders by the name of Padre Paez said, These people have a special place in their minds for the Holy Virgin Mary. So in order to proselytize them, we need to preach the gospel under the umbrella of the Holy Virgin Mary. If you do that, they will be convinced easily. Otherwise, it's difficult. The professor continued, In relation to the presence of the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia, there is a special inclination toward the Holy Virgin Mary in Ethiopia. If you want to compare it with the theology of the Orthodox people in Africa, even with neighboring country Egypt, the sister Coptic Orthodox Church, somehow it is different. The Holy Virgin Mary has a special place in the heart of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Is there any biblical evidence for the view that Mary is the true ark, the living ark? There is the obvious, which the theologians point out. The ark contained the stone tablets of the word. Mary contained within her womb the word of God himself. The contents inside the ark provide more foreshadowing. The manna which is in the pot is to be interpreted as the body of Christ, says the Kibernagost. The pot of gold containing the manna is to be interpreted as Mary. And the rod, which without water burst into bloom, indicates Mary, from whom was born without the seed of man the word of God. Others point to the word overshadowed, used by the archangel Gabriel to describe what would happen to Mary in order to conceive God the Messiah. Said Gabriel, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Luke 1.35 In the New International Version of the Bible, this word is only used elsewhere to refer to the cherubim overshadowing the Ark of the Covenant. Luke wove some marvelous things into his gospel that only a knowledgeable Jew would have understood, writes author and documentarian Steve Ray. When the ark was completed, the glory cloud of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The verb for to cover or to overshadow and the metaphor of a cloud are used in the Bible to represent the presence and glory of God. It's easy to miss the parallel between the Holy Spirit overshadowing the ark and the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary. While many Protestants today struggle with a deep appreciation for Mary, this suspicion was foreign to the first 1,500 years of Christianity and also not a problem for the leaders of the Reformation. Protestant founder Ulrich Zwingli believed Mary, quote, forever remained a pure, intact virgin. John Wesley concurred. The Blessed Virgin Mary continued a pure and unspotted virgin. John Calvin refused to denounce the ever-virgin doctrine. In his last sermon, Martin Luther asked, Is Christ only to be adored, or is the Holy Mother of God rather not to be honored? Several times in each Orthodox Church service occurs this exclamation about Mary, More honorable than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without corruption, thou gave us birth to God the Word. Daily prayers repeat the phrase, Holy, 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 invoking the throne room, followed by, Through the Theotokos, the Mother of God, have mercy on us. These words clearly point to an ark fulfillment. For this reason, many traditional churches depict a large and central icon of Mary above and behind the ark altar table, placing Christ, who is in her womb, precisely in the spot above the ark where the wings of the cherubim provide a throne seat. The previously unknowable God 
for both men and angels has now become known to men more so than angels through his incarnation. This knowledge is intimately entwined with the flesh and blood, the bodily fluids, the sacred body parts, and tender nursing of Mary. The intimacies of birth and motherhood far exceed the only intimacies that most in the reductionist West today are capable of appreciating. This physical enmeshment with God himself now causes the astonished angels to stand back in amazement at the heights to which mankind has ascended, while they eternally cover their eyes shouting, Holy, 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 Mary embraces God himself. In this context, it is plain to see why the Kibra Nagast refers to the Ark almost exclusively as, quote, Lady Zion. The Ethiopian text refers to the king of Ethiopia and Zion, the bride of heaven, and her chariot whereby they move, they shall continue in the Orthodox faith until the coming of our Lord. This, quote, bride of heaven terminology is a natural theme for Ethiopians. They believe they have provided a bride for God and his representative since Sheba came to Solomon in 1000 BC and 500 years earlier when Moses married an Ethiopian. We are told in the Old Testament, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Numbers 12.1 The Lord responds by striking Moses' sister Miriam for a short time with leprosy an ironic case of the skin becoming deathly white. God then states that Moses did indeed hear clearly from the Lord regarding his marriage. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Numbers 12.8 Josephus, the authoritative first century Jewish historian, provides information on Moses' first 40 years in Egypt not recorded in Scripture, giving details on Moses' first marriage before marrying Zipporah, Jethro's daughter, recorded in Exodus 2. Says Josephus, Tharbis was the daughter of the king of the Ethiopians. She happened to see Moses as he led the army near the walls and fought with great courage. She fell deeply in love with him, and upon the prevalence of that passion sent to him the most faithful of all her servants, to discourse with him about their marriage. He thereupon accepted the offer, on condition she would procure the delivering up of the city. And when Moses had cut off the Ethiopians, he gave thanks to God and consummated his marriage and led the Egyptians back to their own land. Second century church father Saint Irenaeus confirms the Ethiopian view that Moses' bride serves as a larger symbol for all God's people. By means of the marriage of Moses was shown forth the marriage of the Word, and by means of the Ethiopian bride the church taken from among the Gentiles was made manifest. The most reliable of all early church historians, Eusebius, hints at this relationship between Ethiopia and all Gentile Christians when he declares Ethiopia the, quote, first fruits of all believers. Bacos, the Ethiopian eunuch from Acts chapter 8, quote, received of the mysteries of the divine word from Philip in consequence of a revelation, and having become the first fruits of believers throughout the world, he is said to have been the first on returning to his country to proclaim the knowledge of the God of the universe and of the life-giving sojourn of our Savior among men, so that through him, in truth, the prophecy obtained its fulfillment, which declares that Ethiopia stretches out her hand unto God. Early church theologian Origen, a major scholar, quotes the bride in Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5, as saying, I am black and beautiful and urges Christians to dig for the mystical exposition. This bride who speaks represents the church gathered from among the Gentiles, says Origen, who then puts his own words in the mouth of the black bride of the Song of Solomon. I am surprised, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you would want to reproach me with the blackness of my hue. 
how have you come to forget what is written in your law? As to what Miriam suffered when she spoke against Moses because he had taken a black Ethiopian to wife. How is it that you do not recognize the true fulfillment of that type in me? I am that Ethiopian. I have received the word made flesh. I have come to him who is the image of God, the firstborn of every creature, and who is the brightness of the glory and the express image of the substance of God, and I have been made fair. Origen then moves to another analogy of the bride and the church, the Queen of Sheba, whom he says is also Ethiopian and black and beautiful. He quotes from 1 Kings 10. And she spoke to him all that was in her heart and relates Solomon to Christ, who, quote, answered all her questions, and there was no question that the king left out and did not so answer, 1 Kings 10, 2 and 3. Origen says the Queen of Sheba came not as a single nation as did the synagogue before her that had the Hebrews only, but the races of the whole world, the church that is gathered from among the Gentiles. A nice summary of the bride theme in Scripture is provided by Presbyterian theologian James Jordan, who, in his exposition on the book of Revelation, explains what is behind the book's finale of a marriage feast. Three is the number of God. Four is the number of creation. Father, Son, Spirit, and Daughter, says Jordan. Those are the four elements that operate in the creation. God the Father, God the only begotten Son, and God the Spirit exist in eternity, and God decides to create an only created daughter. That's what humanity is. Daughter Zion, daughter Jerusalem. And she is supposed to grow up and marry the Son. So there is such a thing as history, and we are in the middle of that. The bride is supposed to get herself ready growing up. What's the plan? The plan is to create a bride for the son, says Jordan. God creates a daughter, and the daughter is supposed to grow up to be a wife for the son. That's what history is. You want to know what the world is all about? That's it, right there.